Okay. Yep. Fine. Öncelikle tabii ki hepinizin konuya hakim olduğunu tahmin ediyorum. In November, I think you all are familiar with the topic today. This is, I mean, as a museum, we started a journey about preservation of technological artworks to begin with, and we're trying to look at the issue from different perspectives with. Thinkers, artists, conservation specialists, curators, collectioners, and people who work in galleries and arts and culture institutions. So we're trying to bring together the perspectives of different stakeholders. And we have identified that um, they actually identified that this hasn't really been looked into in detail. So with this impetus, we're really happy to have you here today. And people who think about this issue, who realize the importance of this issue, are with us, so we're happy to see that. The project continues. Uh, we aim to continue for about a year or so. We'll have more speeches and publications as part of the project, and we'll try to incorporate different stakeholders' perspectives in the days to come. So without much ado, I would like to introduce to you today's speaker, uh, Professor Zelinsky. Personally, uh, Zygfried Zelinsky is an important name for me, I should say. say. Uh, he is a very important name uh, in his respective field, has produced important pieces of work. Uh, you can read the text, actually. There are some characters, you know, some figures. When you start uh, explaining what they have done, it would take longer than their actual presentation. So he's one of those people. And that's why I won't read you his resume. At the end of the presentation, we will have a brief question and answer session, and you will be able to listen to the presentation either in English or in Turkish.
and uh, we are also currently, uh, as we speak, uh, broadcasting this presentation on YouTube. So without much ado, I would like to invite to the floor Professor Zelinsky, please. Good afternoon again. Tekrar uh, merhabalar. It's great to be here. Burada olmak çok güzel. Uh, in Istanbul, uh, İstanbul'da thanks, olmak. Uh, to Selçuk Atut. Selçuk Atut'a teşekkür uh, ediyorum. Of course, also to Öncelikle Osman elbette Karaman, who, Osman Karaman'a da uh, teşekkürlerim var. Event, uh, uh, bu organizasyonu bugün um, için uh, hazırladılar. Great to be back in Istanbul. İstanbul'a tekrar um, geldiğim I için mutluyum. Uh, this is a good place to think about the relations between the deep time layers of the past geçmişin derin katmanlarını bir yandan düşünmek ve bugünü düşünmek ve muhtemel gelecekler üzerine düşünmek için aslında ideal bir yer. Yani dünyada bunun bu kadar ideal olduğu çok fazla yer yok aslında. İstanbul kadar ideal oldu. Collision of the different time modes Farklı zaman um, modlarının can be karşılaştığı fruitful. bir durum. Istanbul is one of the cities uh, which has a deep time bir, civilization, yer. as I call it, uh, which means a civilization which reaches back derken, very far. Çok eskilere giden bir geçmiş var elbette. Binlerce yıl öncesine giden. Opposite to the flat time cultures from the United States, for example, Amerika Birleşik Devletleri ve diğerlerine baktığınızda daha düz bir çizgi görüyorsunuz. Onlar yeni medenileşen ülkeler diyebiliriz. Tabii bu tartışılabilir. Hani medenileştiler mi ayrı bir mevzu tartışılabilir girmeyeceğim ama bugün sonuç olarak in such places um, for me uh, a place like Istanbul uh, is comparable uh, with a place where I just have been before I came to uh, Turkey uh, I was in uh, China uh, and gave lectures in Shanghai and in Beijing um, also China has this very strong Çin'de çok geçmişe dönük um, eskiye dayanan bir kültür ve medeniyet var. Fakat buna rağmen orada them, gördüm ki example, um, Çin'deki automaton from öğrenciler the first century before Christ, uh, milattan önce um, birinci yüzyıldan uh, onlara bir takım çalışmaları sunduğunda again, uh, ki enteresandı bence. Hani, um, şaşırdılar mesela. I, uh, Bu da beni şaşırdı. Will talk about a, a very special case uh, or let's say a variant of uh, what I call media uh, archaeology um, or experimental uh, media archaeology uh, and this is named prospective archaeology. So I hope it's not so difficult to uh, translate that but uh, basically it's very simple. Um, I understand my uh, experimental archaeology not as something nostalgic, something which Arkeolojilerim dediğimde ben bunu sadece nostaljik bir şey olarak algılamıyorum, geriye dönüp geçmişe bakan bir şey olarak algılamıyorum sadece. Daha ziyade farklı zaman katmanları üzerinden geçerek geleceğe giden bir şey olarak algılıyorum. Ve yaptığım ve hoşuma da giden şey şu, bir nevi bir zaman makinesi gibi. Yani şu anda farklı zaman katmanları arasında hareket ediyorum. Um, and, Bazen yüzyıllar uh, arasında I hope, hareket ediyorum. Uh, I will be able today Ve, uh, bugün to de, present uh, these ideas and concepts uh, for you in a very condensed way. Size, um, uh, I toplu bir also will give you uh, some uh, examples uh, of my work and of our work, um, uh, which uh, perhaps uh, make bizim yaptığımız çalışma. Bodies, uh, the shining uh, mobile displays, 
Um, but uh, of course, as archaeologists, we not only want uh, the dead bodies shining uh, in a specific sense, we want to make them uh, reactivate uh, or reactivate it um, to play uh, with them again. This is just another view uh, of this piece. Um, when I was uh, a few days ago in Ljubljana, uh, I met uh, Vadim Fishkin, um, an artist uh, from Ljubljana, uh, who is uh, working a lot uh, with um, ideas and concepts from thermodynamics, thermodynamic. Um, this is a very simple piece. Uh, where uh, you can see it, uh, a candle uh, is lit uh, on the bottom, uh, on the top you have an electric candle um, and uh, the simple device is working with the temperature differences uh, between uh, the, the heated up part and the cooled uh, part of the device. Um, a very beautiful uh, piece um, and uh, these are the kind of pieces uh, which uh, I am worrying a lot uh, when it comes to the present and when it comes to the future. When I entered the museum uh, it was dead, there was nothing shining uh, and the people in the museum didn't even know that they have to light a candle uh, underneath to make the whole piece work. <laughs> so I told them what they have to do. Um, this is of course not my task uh, but um, it's uh, perhaps um, uh, something typical which we can see in all kinds of museums all over the world at the moment. The museums very simply are not prepared uh, for this uh, kind of challenges um, which we have and I think uh, that what you are doing here at the moment uh, to create uh, a cooperation um, between uh, a university, uh, the museum and of course the artists uh, is uh, really uh, very well. Or parties uh, uh, it's possible um, to, to solve uh, the, the problems and to pick up the challenges uh, in a, a productive uh, way. Future, uh, this is absolutely clear for me and for my concept of thinking and of making. Um, media archaeology uh, is not identical. Future is not identical with the past, with the presences which had been in the past. But it needs a kind of deep time activity and structure. It needs a relation with deep time, the times which have passed, for developing the potential spaces which will come. Potential spaces is a term I use again and again. Just uh, a short explanation, I will come back to that, uh, so I explain it at the beginning. Um, potential spaces is a term which I, could f uh, which I took from uh, Donald Winnicott, uh, a British uh, psychiatrist um, and psychoanalysist. Um, he worked a little bit in the shadow of the great Jacques Lacan and is not so well known. With potential spaces, uh, he names this period of time in uh, the development uh, of a person, of an individuality, uh, where uh, especially uh, the young children explore everything and test everything and make experiments with everything uh, to learn about uh, the reality they live in, um, the world they live in. Uh, I like this term a lot and I project it uh, on our own work, um, potential uh, spaces. Basically, um, I look uh, at the past and uh, at the future as potential spaces, as spaces which we still can work on, which we can design, which we permanently interpre interpret, interpret and uh, reinterpret. Um, this is uh, a very important uh, starting point epistemologically um, because um, to look at the past as a potential space means that the past is not just a factological given 
uh, firm entity, uh, but it's something uh, we can still work on and we can still generate. Uh, we want uh, the future, of course, open, to be open for us, for our activities, um, and we should uh, project the same kind of openness uh, and the same kind of demand of openness um, into the past uh, and uh, to uh, create uh, this uh, tension uh, which will rumor uh, in my uh, presentation. Um, I would like to introduce uh, at the beginning um, a few uh, let's say, uh, demands uh, which I would like to formulate to the different parties, the different groups which are also gathering uh, here. Um, this, the first demand uh, is uh, something like um, the demand for documentation, for precise documentation uh, of a work. The second, uh, which is closely connected with that, is the demand for manuals for elaborated manuals when it comes to techno-based arts and the third one um, is what I uh, connect with uh, my methodological um, principle uh, of a happy finding uh, that is um, the uh, let's say self-explanation uh, of uh, machines or of techno-based arts um, which uh, creates a kind of a tautology um, in uh, media expression um, but which is extremely fruitful of course for us uh, as archaeologists, as people who are uh, running museums uh, and of course also uh, for artists. I just used the example of Kenneth C. Knowlton um, who is uh, one of the very early engineers uh, who dealt uh, with computers uh, with uh, an artistic ambition um, in the 1960s together with uh, Leon D. Harmon. Uh, he uh, created uh, this uh, nude uh, pixel person um, for the exhibition The Machine as seen at the end of the Mechanical Age. Um, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in 1968, uh, curated by Ponto Sultan. Um, this piece is quite iconic and it has become quite iconic. Also, now it only exists as uh, reproductions, as photo reproductions. Um, years ago, many years ago, I fell over um, a film which um, caught my uh, excitement, so to speak. Um, it's called a computer technique uh, for the production of animated movies. The director of this film is the same Kenneth C. Knowlton. The film was made in 1963-1964 um, in the uh, framework of the Bell Laboratory. Um, I happened many years ago in our technical university when I was studying there uh, to find in one of the cupboards uh, with a lot of film uh, stuff, film material, film rolls, uh, this film um, and I kept it because I immediately thought I was very young at that time. This is something extremely special and we are very happy uh, that uh, we have this film now. For example, it's it just was exhibited in a large exhibition at the ZKM. Um, this is one of these cases of a happy finding. Uh, this film uh, by Kenneth C. Knowlton um, introduces um, a method for computer animation, a very rough raw method for computer animation and what is interesting, the film is made with the same technique uh, which he is presenting. Uh, this is what I meant with this tautological uh, construction. Uh, so you can see the movie on computer animation which is made with the same method uh, as it's showing. Um, and uh, this is of course happening very seldom uh, in history, in art history, when it comes to uh, techno-based arts. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, artists are doing uh, things like that. Um, and uh, for us uh, archaeologists uh, is, it's of course uh, a very happy uh, situation. Uh, the program language uh, was called BFLIX, uh, which is, uh, I think, an abbreviation which has to do with the Bell Labs and so on, uh, but this is not so important. 
important it was done for this very large IBM 7094 uh, machine um, at the beginning of the 1960s which uh, filled half of this room here perhaps um, unimaginable uh, for us now um, so uh, it was extremely raw. Um, when it comes to uh, techno-based uh, arts for the past and I'm still uh, in the 20th century I will go back much further um, in my presentation. When it comes uh, to um, the techno-based arts of the 20th century, um, sometimes, especially when you uh, go through the early uh, 20th century, uh, sometimes uh, critiques uh, are extremely helpful. Um, decades ago I fell over uh, perhaps the biggest uh, techno party and the biggest techno event which was ever done um, in uh, uh, Russia uh, in uh, Baku 1922 and in Moscow in 1923. Uh, this was called the Symphony uh, of Sirens. The idea uh, behind this uh, piece was um, that the whole city of Baku and the whole city of Moscow um, could be, should become one big music box. Um, the uh, director of this piece was Avramov. Uh, a very interesting uh, composer and director who also invented some musical instruments, um, another story, um, and uh, practically there is nothing left from this performance. It was a performed based uh, piece, um, but uh, I found with the help of some uh, Russian uh, students, uh, I found uh, in the archives of St. Petersburg and Moscow uh, very, very precise critiques uh, of this performance uh, from which it was able to reconstruct uh, what they uh, had done, roughly at least. Uh, we knew that they, knew that they used, for example, um, huge um, machinery uh, from the whole city uh, which made noises, uh, symphony of sirens, uh, they used ships, they used aeroplanes, uh, they used uh, guns, uh, they used machine guns uh, and everything which made noise. Um, the choir in Moscow uh, I think was 10,000 young people, um, in Baku it was a little bit less, a few thousand uh, people uh, and they were all uh, making the city sounding uh, as a music box um, and in 2017 uh, there was a chance in Czechian, in Brno, um, to reconstruct that piece. You can see me here on the bottom standing in front of uh, several concrete mixers um, which were uh, some of the musical instruments uh, we used. We had uh, train engines, we had uh, all kinds of noise producing machine um, and uh, the hardcore uh, aesthetical part, the artistic part was done by um, FM Einheit, uh, one of the uh, percussionists from Einstürzende Neubauten, together with uh, the radio artist uh, Andreas Ammer. Um, and I had the pleasure uh, to play this Avramov uh, with 400 musicians, singers, gun shooters, bikers, cars, machines, um, and locomotive engines, uh, and re perform this uh, thing. Um, but uh, the most important point, I will not uh, play this performance now because it uh, would need a lot of time, most important was that this reconstruction was made on the base of critiques, uh, very very detailed critiques which are practically in the art world not existing anymore because you know the the journalists who are writing art critiques uh, they write about all kinds of things but not about the objects and not about the artifacts uh, they wrote about their ideas and whatever um, but not uh, about uh, the work of art uh, which has changed uh, a lot um, so uh, the critique can be a, a very important key for um, this uh, we also integrated a few uh, Harley Davidson drivers, uh, which uh, caused a wonderful sound uh, for our compositions. Um, just quickly, um, what is uh, as uh, important as a very good critique from the past um, is uh, manual, um, is manuals. Um, for most of the things we have done uh, in this uh, field of prospective archaeology. Um, we uh, could use uh, existing manuals, 
but uh, this is easier said than done <laughs> when it comes to uh, the deep time layers uh, of the past um, because uh, many of these manuals uh, are first very difficult to access now, um, second uh, they are in a shape uh, like the uh, technical artifacts themselves which are uh, ruined, which are broken, um, which have to be reconstructed uh, like uh, this uh, wonderful book here which is a, a unique manuscript from Al Muradi, the book of secrets uh, from the 11th uh, century which was reconstructed by the L3 group uh, in Milano um, and uh, which was financed by the Emir of Qatar uh, because it cost a lot of money to uh, reconstruct this uh, manual, make it readable again uh, with computer analysis um, and as you have seen here already it even contained uh, um, diagrams uh, which is of course uh, a big luck for those who want to reconstruct these kind of things um, and the machinery which the L3 group in Milano built um, on the base of the uh, reconstruction of the book of the manuscript uh, looked uh, like that, a little bit naive uh, but uh, you got an idea uh, how uh, the machines in this case it's a clockwork, it's a time measuring device uh, how they worked, you can see the two buckets which created the permanent energy flow um, and uh, you can see some of the mechanical elements uh, which I will not comment, I will uh, show you some uh, other uh, objects a little bit later in uh, greater detail. Um, origin, as I said already, uh, and future uh, are not uh, identical and also the other way around. Future is not identical uh, with the origin, but um, this uh, equation which uh, I uh, took from um, philosopher Martin Heidegger uh, and as you can see I crossed it through. Um, this equation makes uh, sense uh, when it's uh, let's say dissolved uh, because uh, it uh, still has the tension between the origin and the future uh, as an important uh, starting point. Um, the possibility of being able to think, to dream to draft uh, and to configure through past presents into those of the future opens up for me at least a very particular kind of experimental space which I call prospective archaeology. It is just as much a space of doing as it is a space of thinking. This is very important. A non-trivial relation between thinking and making, uh, which is carrying my work a lot. Through making things, you think the things in a special, dense way. And of course, it helps you very much to develop your concepts, your uh, concepts also in the true sense of the term, Begriffe, uh, the thinking processes we need to construct uh, the world. Realities, future realities, including the arts of presence will, which will still come, obviously do not emerge, this is a triviality, from out of nothing, they are always generated from past presences and those sedimentations which we refer to as historical complexity. Since we cannot know the future, the equivalence formulated by philosopher Heidegger that it remains identical with the past makes no sense. Heidegger's equivalence, origin is identical with future, subjects the past to the primacy of time still to come. It includes in a nutshell both modes of the experience of time. This is a very complex thought, perhaps we can discuss that later, um, but what I try to formulate here uh, is something which I fear at the moment uh, when it comes to using artifacts and all kinds of testimonies uh, of the past, very often they are really just used 
economically. Uh, they are uh, used as, a, as a, an endless resource, so to speak, how we use uh, the fossils uh, for our energy. Um, but of course, uh, these rich past is also limited uh, in resources uh, and we have to take care that the way we are handling it uh, is not ruining the planet, so to speak, uh, on which we are living, is not ruin ruining uh, the field in which we are working uh, and this is simply uh, the arts. When I uh, construct uh, this um, prospective archaeology, um, I work with this uh, simple sketch um, which also contains the epistemic aim, the epistemic thing uh, I want to generate. You can uh, work with in this time machine which I'm trying to explain to you. You can work with two opposite time arrows. One time arrow, uh, one time arrow is going into the future presences. The other time arrow is going into the past presences. Uh, these two time arrows are colliding in the now. The now as all the physicists amongst you and the philosophers amongst you know uh, has no extension. It's an imagination. Um, it's there but we can't grasp it because it has no extension. But um, it is, um, let's say, uh, you, can, you can conceptualize it um, as something where these two time arrows collide and where they create something. Uh, and what they create for me is um, surprise. Uh, the uh, different uh, directions and energies of the two time arrows create or generate uh, surprise, new knowledge, something new about the world, also something new about the past. Uh, I took this uh, term, generators of surprise, from Molen Hoagland, uh, a, an experimental biologist, biologist from the United States. He wrote a wonderful book in 1990 on experimental biology um, and he uses this term, generators of surprise, to name uh, the character or the, the, the, the essential uh, of uh, an experiment. Uh, experiments are only making sense uh, if you are really uh, opening them up for all kind of surprises, if they are closed right from the beginning uh, regarding the epistemic uh, aims, uh, then it's just tests. Uh, it has nothing to do uh, with experiment or not, not very much to do uh, with experiments. Past and future as potential spaces, um, this is uh, what uh, constructs uh, the, let's say, the epistemical uh, framework, epistemological framework, uh, what I'm uh, talking about about um, and uh, for the uh, next part uh, I would like to go into a few uh, examples of exhibitions uh, of art practices, of experimental art practices uh, which make hopefully uh, a bit clearer uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, First, uh, a project uh, which we uh, developed uh, through 2017 until 2018. Um, it started a little bit earlier already in Barcelona uh, at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. Um, it was picked up yeah, already 2016 um, with some uh, strong research um, on uh, Ramon Lull, um, a late medieval monk um, some of you might know him, some of you who are familiar uh, with the genealogy uh, of algorithmical devices. Um, <coughs> Ramon Lull uh, was uh, living in, uh, in uh, Mallorca. Um, he was a Catalan, but he, was, uh, he grew up and was living in Mallorca, uh, which is, uh, or which has been in the late Middle Ages, an extremely interesting place and space 
because uh, it worked like an interface between different cultures, the Muslim culture, the Christian culture, uh, and the Jewish culture. Um, and of course, it was also uh, right in the center of a lot of political tensions and struggles uh, and cultural struggles and so on. Um, especially between uh, the different religious groups. Uh, there were strong fights uh, in the late Middle Ages too. Um, and this uh, monk um, had uh, this wonderful uh, idea um, to develop a kind of a utopian concept uh, for communication uh, between uh, the different uh, groups, the different cultures, um, the different uh, religions. Um, this goes back, I have no time to, to really uh, elaborate on that, uh, but this uh, kind of utopian thinking um, about technology for me is extremely important. I just have to give you perhaps uh, uh, an idea about where I come from um, so that you can uh, understand it a little bit better. Um, I studied uh, at an institute uh, in Berlin at the Technical University of Berlin uh, which is called uh, Institute for Language in a Technological Age. The remarkable thing about this institute was it was founded in 1961, more than half a century ago. And it was founded, uh, amongst many other reasons, uh, for a specific uh, political reason, so to speak, uh, because in 1961 the wall was built uh, in Berlin. Um, and uh, the language uh, of propaganda uh, took over again the cultural sphere and the intellectual sphere. And there was a gang of poets and of musicians, of experimental theater people, who said, no, uh, we cannot accept that. Uh, let's try to develop alternatives. Let's give machines a chance. Perhaps they can do better than human beings uh, in creating language, in creating poetry, in creating music, uh, which is different from that uh, which we just went through, through the Nazi period uh, and uh, again uh, the uh, totalitarian uh, situation uh, in East uh, Berlin and uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, Aaron Chikain, uh, an Israeli uh, artist uh, who uh, wrote this wonderful book, A Muslim, A Christian uh, and a Jew, uh, made a graffiti uh, some years ago. I took this, uh, my partner took this photo in 2017, um, which has these three figures uh, here uh, walking behind each other, a Muslim, a Christian and a Jew, um, don't realize uh, that uh, they were following each other in great proximity for quite a while already. Um, this is just um, a photo, an artifact, which perhaps uh, I use it as a passport toto, um, which uh, makes clear a little bit how such a research works. Uh, it works uh, in a lot of different fields, also in everyday life, um, even when it's uh, about um, a late medieval monk. Uh, another kind of research we have to do when you try to approach such a phenomenon is to look of course at the literature uh, and to see uh, what they have uh, done uh, in earlier uh, exhibitions, in earlier books, in earlier publications uh, on our subject. Uh, one of the earliest uh, testimonies I found uh, in the 20th century was Jessia Reichert's uh, very uh, famous and iconic exhibition, Cybernetic Serendipity from 1968 at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London, The Computer and the Arts. This was the subtitle uh, of the exhibition and on the first pages already you find this strange drawing uh, of a, a paper computer, uh, a logic uh, machine, um, which was an adaptation of Ramon Lull's machine um, and uh, which was explained uh, as a cybernetical uh, machine. Um, and of course all these elements, there are many, many more, help us to reconstruct uh, what has been done and uh, what the artifact we are interested in um, are really uh, about. 
the paper, the, the machines which, uh, which Ramon Lull, um, let's say, uh, designed by himself were made uh, of paper and they were definitely built and used uh, in various contexts. Um, the intention we had by approaching these machines was to create something which Lull could not think yet uh, to create a computer device or a software uh, through which uh, his famous Ars Magna, his great art, uh, could be generated uh, as a, as a uh, progressive and processive uh, form of art. Um, just to remind you what Ramon Lull's art was about, um, some of you might know it, his starting point for creating a communication tool between uh, the Muslim world, the Jewish world and the Christian world was very simple. He said uh, these are all monotheistic religions. They are all based on the concept of one God and they are all based on one book each. Um, the Bible, uh, the Talmud and the Quran. If this is the case, he said, it should be possible that I use these books and these concepts as sources for constructing a formal code with which it is possible to communicate uh, between the large complexities uh, which are contained uh, in the different books and in the different concepts. Um, with the help of a, a formalization, uh, it should also be possible to bridge uh, the differences between the languages, uh, Latin, uh, Hebrew um, and uh, the Arab language. So his aim was uh, to create one symbolic code uh, out of these three languages um, and out of this vast knowledge which, which was incorporated uh, in the books. Um, and uh, this is what he called his Ars Magna uh, Combinatoria, uh, one thinking machine uh, which is able to play uh, with this symbolic code uh, and to regenerate the complexities uh, we uh, need uh, to think religious and philosophically. This is how, uh, is it sharp? I think it looks a little bit unsharp at the moment, uh, but perhaps it's my glasses. Uh, hope you can see it. Uh, this is the paperwork uh, which uh, Ramon Lull basically did. This is from the 15th century. Uh, in the center here you can see the the basic uh, rotating disk uh, which he constructed uh, with the different uh, characterizations, the axioms um, which uh, react to the question of to the questions of who is God and what is God, and then you have here other layers uh, which you can uh, put uh, on the top of each other, uh, and with the help of these uh, rotating layers, uh, you can create. Uh, relatively uh, complex uh, um, text um, uh, generators uh, which uh, help you to understand uh, what uh, the different uh, religious uh, are talking, the different religions are talking about. Uh, a highly sophisticated design form uh, as you can see. Uh, there are many different variations existing um, in the literature. Um, I was very excited when we finally also found out um, that uh, there is an Arabic version um, of this Ars Magna from Ramon Lull um, at, uh, the, uh, at the library in Aleppo. Uh, when we made this research, uh, the war um, in Syria was uh, very strong um, and uh, so we could not go there to Aleppo, uh, but finally uh, because we really insisted uh, over a long period of time, we were able to get at least the book uh, over to Karlsruhe uh, and were able to show uh, the Arabic version of the Ars Magna together with the Hebrew version uh, of the Ars Magna, which was not so difficult to get. It stems from the Senegal um, and uh, it was a short version of the Ars Magna. Um, it's from the Jewish uh, Theological Seminar uh, in New York. Uh, the 
manuscript is from the, as you can see, from the 15th century. So it was, able, it was possible, finally, um, to put uh, the Hebrew, the Arabic and the Latin version uh, of this Ars Magna together in one glass vitrine. Uh, they were lying side by side, back to back, uh, communicating with each other. Um, art can create something which reality cannot create anymore, uh, or at least not at the moment, perhaps in the future it will be possible again. And there you can see this philosophical implication uh, uh, very clearly uh, going through the past uh, of this crazy monk uh, of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th century. Uh, you can uh, take his ideas um, and uh, uh, and experiment with them uh, in the present, uh, in the presence, and uh, perhaps towards a better uh, future. Um, the uh, work uh, regarding um, the uh, software transformation or the transformation of the Ars Magna into a working software um, was not done the first time um, when we started this project uh, for Barcelona and the ZKM and for other places. Um, there was an attempt in the 1980s already uh, in Germany uh, to write a software um, for uh, Ars Magna. Werner Künzel did that, who is now living in Napoli. Um, he used the COBOL algorithm uh, to transform uh, his uh, thoughts, Lull's thought, into um, a functioning software. This is how uh, the Struktogramm uh, looked like. Uh, this is the part, the main program, uh, the steering part uh, for the machine. Um, a very rough form, uh, which uh, to reread again it was not so easy. Of course, we had He's still living, we could uh, invite him. Uh, I met him in Berlin several times, I know him from earlier years, and with the help of him uh, we were able to reconstruct his software. Uh, this was the first step, of course, but we were quite unsatisfied um, with uh, this first attempt, and then um, this is uh, again documents from, from, from his work from the 1980s, uh, and then we made a simple device um, Philip Tögel uh, realized that for the ZKM uh, as a reinterpretation of the Ars Generalis Ultima uh, in form of an interactive uh, processing based installation. Um, this means that uh, now people who do not understand much about uh, computers, uh, young people, uh, even kids, uh, can go into the uh, museum, into the exhibition and start to play with this uh, software application uh, and get an idea what an algorithmical device has been in the 13th century. I'm not talking about history of computer in this context, I'm talking about the genealogy or the history of algorithmic devices. This is an algorithmical device, as everybody knows, uh, to, uh, to construct something like that and to make it work in a material world. Um, you don't need a computer, uh, you can do it with all kind of uh, physical uh, material. Um, but uh, this is another question which we uh, might perhaps uh, discuss later. Uh, the LUL um, approach to uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, communication devices was extremely uh, important. Uh, for later generations, the most well-known um, for you uh, might be Gott, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, he wrote his uh, Dissertatio de Arte Combinatoria uh, in the 17th century, um, which was a Dissertatio a tractatus uh, on Ramon Lull um, and uh, with the aim to create out of Ramon Lull's thought something like a, a universal science, uh, a science which should uh, um, frame uh, the whole knowledge of the world. Um, at the same time, a little bit later, uh, Leibniz uh, worked uh, on uh, interpreting uh, the diagrams of the I Ching, uh, the hexagrams uh, which uh, he uh, got as presents from Chinese mission from uh, Christian missionaries from China, um, and as you know, he interpreted them as a as a kind of a binary code, um, and uh, in this combination of Lull's work uh, and the I Ching, the Book of Change, um, he developed uh, his 
uh, basic uh, concepts for uh, a binary code, uh, which is still more or less valuable for today. There were other um, great writers uh, and scientists uh, from the 17th century uh, who worked with similar and comparable concepts. Uh, for example, Athanasius Kircher um, in his uh, book uh, on the subterranean world, but also in his book on uh, Ars Magna uh, Scientis, the great book uh, of knowledge, um, the Tabula Combinatoria, in this case using examples from alchemy, the endless uh, possibilities for combina combinating uh, different elements uh, to complexities uh, which help us to understand the world and to generate uh, the world in an artificial uh, way. Uh, also in cryptology, um, Lull's work uh, played a very important role. Also this uh, object is not existing anymore. Um, it's a cryptological device, uh, a cryptological theater as I call it, from the 16th century constructed by Giovanni Battista della Porta. For those of you who know my work on deep time a little bit, uh, you know that della Porta is one of the inventors of the cinema too, but this is another story uh, which we will not touch uh, today. Um, and uh, nobody would wonder, also della Porta was working um, on the challenge uh, of creating a binary code for cryptological language. Uh, he worked with two discrete signs, um, a line uh, and a dot, and with the help of these two discrete signs, a line and a dot, uh, he was able to create uh, a secret uh, code um, for uh, the Latin language, uh, in this case the reduced Latin language, uh, which made you able to communicate, for example, uh, with your friend uh, when he was in a prison um, and uh, the, the guys who were uh, taking care for you in the prison uh, should not read uh, the messages. Um, a beautiful book uh, from 1603, the first version um, was written in uh, 1561 and I'm very happy this is uh, part of my unarchive. Uh, I can read this book at home. Uh, and uh, play with it. Um, so uh, this is uh, a uh, disc uh, from 1305 where this idea uh, which later was picked up in the technique, uh, in different techniques of cryptology uh, was uh, already formulated in a specific sense. Um, it stems from the Ars Inveniendi uh, Particularia in Universalibus uh, from Ramon Lull. Uh, the fragments are, uh, you can study them in the Escorial, in the famous Escorial um, library in Madrid, um, which helped us a lot to put our exhibition uh, into reality. Uh, this is a cryptological disc uh, developed by Alberti, the famous architect who also was very deeply working um, in uh, cryptological uh, languages uh, and cryptological technology, so to speak. This is of course a later replica uh, of his disc. And when it comes to the art world, uh, you can see uh, that this kind of basic uh, ideas which Ramon Lull developed with the uh, layers of different rotating discs uh, with uh, information elements on it um, was also used in music. Arnold Schoenberg used one of these dials which he built by himself uh, for constructing his 12-tone 12 12 uh, music. At, immediately when it comes to forms of music which are highly mathematical or which went through mathematical thoughts, uh, then it's of course not very difficult um, to apply uh, this kind of uh, ideas of Lull uh, into uh, concrete musical uh, experiments. Um, these are just a few examples. I could also go into architecture. Daniel Liebeskind uh, built uh, in 1997 a virtual house uh, as a model. Uh, this was never built in reality, but it was built as a model. Um, later in Mallorca, uh, he also realized a similar building. Um, or uh, current artists, uh, you might know the work of Ralf Becker. He was one of my diploma students in Cologne when I founded the uh, Art Academy in Cologne. Uh, this is called the Calculating Space. Um, I would, I really wonder what will happen in, let's say, 40, 50 years. This, this, this piece is quite famous meanwhile. Uh, when a museum uh, is asked to build that up again, uh, I think uh, they will not only need uh, 
a documentation which is perhaps 50 pages long, uh, but also people who uh, understand a lot about uh, algorithms and a lot about material, uh, about feedback, uh, feedback loops and so on and so on. So you need really specialized people uh, who are able uh, to reconstruct something like that, but uh, we will hear more uh, about that a little bit later. Um, the, uh, the value uh, and the impact uh, of uh, Ramon Lull's thinking uh, went deep into the construction of, uh, of uh, calculating uh, machines. This is a beautiful uh, machine from Matthäus Hahn from 1770, also a priest and a, and a theologist and a monk like, uh, like Ramon Lull himself, uh, who uh, used Ramon Lull's ideas for constructing his own devices, also um, the uh, astronomical clocks which had been built in the 18th century uh, have a strong connection uh, with his early devices um, in the late uh, Middle Ages. Um, one of the projects I want uh, to generate now uh, is uh, titled Priest's Mechanics. Uh, it will be on the interrelation between religion uh, and sophisticated uh, technological artifacts. Um, there is, uh, the world is very, very rich, filled with these kind of uh, ideas and artifacts. Um, and I hope I will be able um, to uh, generate also this, this project in form of an exhibition, definitely in form of publication. Um, and uh, of books, just to give you an example, um, in the center uh, of this project, uh, clockwork uh, will play an important role, um, and sophisticated clockwork, uh, I just found out um, that uh, the most important uh, element, the most important mechanical element uh, for the mechanical clocks, um, which uh, help to transform a continuous movement into a discontinuous uh, situation with which you can calculate, which you can count, um, has been uh, thought and conceptualized by a Buddhist monk uh, in 700 and 24 or 23, uh, early 8th century in China. Um, and again, uh, you can see this is a very important part of my deep time thinking. The deeper you go in time, the deeper you go down through the layers of history, uh, the more you have to think and work horizontally um, through the different cultures, through the different religions, through the different uh, sciences. Uh, this is extremely important, otherwise you get stuck uh, completely. Uh, I'd give you an example which is uh, also close to uh, your uh, traditions, cultural traditions, uh, so to speak. Uh, Seljuk invited me um, 10 years ago um, to talk about my concept of an institute for southern uh, modernities at Sabangshi University. Um, and at this time I was still preparing this um, things and objects uh, which uh, we later on uh, reconstructed as uh, technical artifacts. Um, the title of this project was Alas Automata um, and it was uh, generated uh, since 2015 in form of exhibitions and publications. Um, <clears throat> I tried to find people um, in different parts of the world uh, who were able to reconstruct uh, a clockwork, a very complex clockwork, um, which we uh, wanted as part of the exhibition. This uh, clockwork went back to Al-Jazari um, in the uh, year uh, 1206, early 13th century. Finally, um, with the help of a friend from, from Turkey, um, I went to the Science Center in Konya, uh, in Bursa, uh, and uh, we uh, met these wonderful people uh, who said, uh, very simple, science is for everybody, we built that for you. Uh, and within a few weeks uh, or a few months, uh, they were able to reconstruct this beautiful elephant clock, uh, which is quite uh, a complex uh, device for measuring, for not only measuring time, but uh, experiencing time as a listener and somebody who is watching this automaton. It's an automaton um, and uh, you can look at time, how time 
passes and you can listen uh, to time, how time uh, passes. Um, I was very happy uh, with uh, the reconstruction. It was a little bit naive, but it was, it, it was working, unfortunately, not very long. After two months it was broken and then we had sent it back to Bursa. Uh, but uh, you can build it, of course, much more solid. Um, it's extremely interesting to, to, to look at this uh, to look at this machine um, from the outside uh, for five seconds uh, because uh, Al Jazari uh, coming from not far away he from here, um, he uh, incorporated in this machine uh, the whole knowledge and the whole knowledge traditions uh, on which he was working, the giants on, on, on, on whose shoulders he was working. Um, on the top uh, you can see a bird, uh, this is a uh, phoenix. Uh, he's singing uh, when the machine is running, uh, making mechanical noises. The bird, the phoenix is coming, is a reference to Egypt. Um, then you can see here, in the front, uh, two falcons. Um, who, of course, are references to the Arabian culture. You can't see them very well here. They spit out uh, the iron balls, which then make the dragon underneath move. The dragon is a reference to Chinese culture. Uh, these are Chinese dragons. These are not just any dragons. Uh, and Al Jazari describes it in his text. It's Chinese dragons. Um, and then uh, on the bottom, uh, you see the elephant. This is an Indian elephant. Um, the Indian elephant has a Persian carpet uh, on his back. <laughs> These are all references uh, to the knowledge cultures which Al Jazari know. You must imagine that nowadays. I mean, now scientists have to write footnotes when they are writing scientific papers. And if they are good, uh, the footnotes are correct. Um, and they don't pinch uh, the stuff simply. Um, but uh, when it comes, for example, to European modernity, you have all these this bright thinkers, René Descartes, and Athanasius Kirche and others, they never have any references to the Arabic culture and to the Muslim culture, Silch. But they pinched most of their knowledge um, and everything they knew about uh, ancient, Greece, ancient Greek culture and Egypt culture, uh, they know from the translations, of course, which uh, the guys uh, in Baghdad, uh, the Banu Musa uh, and others made in the 9th century or in the uh, 10th century. Um, here you can see a clear um, gesture. Um, I, the genius engineer uh, was relying on many, many different knowledge cultures. Only on this space it was possible to uh, create uh, this wonderful uh, machine. This is the uh, electronic uh, heart uh, of the machine, uh, which I have no time now uh, to explain. Uh, another example which uh, excited me uh, a lot uh, is uh, the musical automaton, uh, which has been um, uh, yeah, uh, designed uh, in the 9th century, 850, around 850, uh, in the House of Wisdom in uh, Baghdad. Uh, and there you can see, these are the challenges uh, when there are a few centuries uh, in between uh, the, the invention uh, and uh, the reconstruction or restoration or whatever. This machine, I'm quite sure, was never built but it was conceptualized in a very, very precise way. And uh, with the help uh, of my students in Berlin, uh, we were finally able uh, to build this machine. Um, so this is a specific case. Uh, it's not a restoration. Uh, this machine was built the first time. It was only existing uh, as a paper, um, and it was built the first time uh, some years ago. Um, there was one attempt, an earlier attempt to build it, but it did not function, it did not work. I saw the piece. You can also see it in, in uh, here in Istanbul. Um, there is a museum for the history of uh, uh, Arabic uh, and Islamic sciences uh, built up by uh, a Turkish uh, scholar, uh, I forgot the name at the moment. Um, uh, it's uh, right here in the center uh, of, of uh, the European part of Istanbul. Um, and yeah, there you can see this machine, but it's, it's, just a, it's just a model. It does not work, it's just uh, the idea. Um, we made this 
manuscript uh, which was extremely difficult to find, readable with the help of uh, computers uh, and cleaned it uh, and so on and finally we translated it into English. Um, we found it by the way in Beirut uh, in Lebanon um, and we translated it uh, into English and into German so that the students could work with it. Uh, the first sentence, uh, the first sentences in this manuscript from 850 is up absolutely mind-blowing for media archaeologists. Uh, it says in translation into English, we wish to explain how an instrument is made which plays by itself continuously in whatever melody we wish, sometimes in a slow rhythm and sometimes in a quick rhythm, and also that we may change from melody to melody when we so desire. What you uh, can read here is the description of what Alan Turing uh, would have called in the 20th century a universal machine. This machine should be able to play all kinds of music um, and steer all kinds of instruments, so it's a universal uh, machine. Um, and um, the, to, to understand that uh, was the first step uh, for myself and for the students uh, to uh, to uh, make this project uh, on reconstructing it. Of course, we read a lot of literature, uh, the organ of the ancients and so on. I will not bore you with that, but this is the main construction or the basis construction of the musical automaton from 850. You have an energy supply, a permanent energy supply here on the side, on the left side. On the right hand, you have the musical instrument, in this case, an organ pipe in the center. And this is the most remarkable thing. You have this rotating drum and these are the inscriptions, the program inscriptions, uh, the informatic part so to speak. Um, the, uh, in this case it's teeth of wood or metal uh, which are uh, installed uh, on the rotating drum and when the drum is rotating uh, this uh, mechanical transition is moved and it opens and closes a pallet for example. Uh, we used uh, the example, this is the energy supply which we animated, uh, we did not use the water supply because the ZKM would have killed us in the museum um, if we would have used water uh, <laughs> and, and pneumatic devices um, beside a manuscript uh, which is 800 years old <laughs> and which costs a fortune to transport to, to the ZKM. So we just made an animation uh, to make clear how the thing uh, works. Uh, and then of course the piece itself uh, done by uh, a Russian uh, and a Chinese uh, student um, who, uh, who built it uh, on the left hand. We use the example of a Zornai. Uh, you see the, the Zornai hanging here. When you are playing the Zornai, uh, your movements of the fingers uh, are uh, transformed, so to speak. Uh, they are linked uh, to this uh, mechanical uh, metal pieces here uh, which inscribe the information into the rotating drum and then on the other hand you have the player uh, and you can play the Zornai again. Uh, of course we proved it uh, inside of the exhibition. You could press a button and it was working with rough raw music but it worked <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a really surprise and to go through that, this is the remarkable thing, to go through something like that with, with people who are 20 years old or 22 years or students um, is something extraordinary. First they understand, wow, what did this kid do there <laughs> in, in, in, in Baghdad? Uh, this was also the middle of the war when, when we did this reconstruction and for everybody in Germany um, people in Baghdad were, were just uh, barbarians so to speak and suddenly they realize they are not barbarians, they are very very intelligent people who, who were much further more than thousand years ago than we are now. Um, and uh, this is, uh, this is one implication of such a project. But to understand how they thought algorithmically, what an algorithm meant for them, because this is nothing but an algorithmical device, um, this is something very uh, extraordinary and it helps a lot um, to, to think your own position in history with more modesty. Uh, we are not always at the climax uh, of civilization. Sometimes we are far back and others have been in the past uh, much more forward uh, than we are now. Uh, this is uh, two of the sketches, uh, the player and the recording device. Uh, we have no time. Uh, this was the moment when um, the, the 
it was proof that the machine can work. Uh, and this was the main programmer behind the thing, Liang Chi Peng, um, together with Petya Ivanova from Moscow. Uh, he did the programming and the precision engineering. As we know, again, uh, we have no time. I cannot go deeper into that. This was the core mechanism uh, which drove the whole history of automaton, uh, in, uh, especially in Europe. Um, most of the machines you are uh, very familiar with uh, in church bell systems, in different kind of uh, uh, contexts. This is a large version of this rotating drum uh, installed uh, in a church in the 14th century, um, of course with no reference to the Banu Musa. And when it comes to the famous automata from the 18th century, this is the inner life of Wokasson's automatic flute player uh, with the rotating drum here. Um, on the left side, uh, or when it comes to the um, spinet uh, musician uh, from Jacques Dross, the great automaton builder from Switzerland from the 18th century. And when you uh, take her clothes off, uh, you can see uh, that uh, it's dri she's driven by the same device um, as uh, this uh, as this Banu Musa automaton from 850. Uh, when you imagine um, a projection uh, of the program part uh, of this uh, automaton um, into uh, a two-dimensional uh, surface, uh, then you have uh, Athanasius Kircher did that in the 17th century, then you have uh, a pattern which you are uh, familiar with from uh, the history of uh, computing, especially from uh, IBM and, and, and others, the punch card system. Um, so uh, this uh, negative, the idea of this uh, projection uh, onto a negative surface as a, as a program information uh, is already uh, much, much older than the new computer. So I think uh, time has run out for me and I cannot, um, I cannot uh, go into the next project. Uh, how much time do we have? Really? Okay, then, then, then uh, I just, because I wanted, at the end, I wanted to jump again a little bit closer. Perhaps it's a bridge to the, to the projects which are coming now um, uh, to uh, the 20th century. Um, in 2015, uh, we were able, uh, in cooperation between the Academy of Arts in Berlin and the ZKM, uh, to develop, uh, yeah, it, I think it was the first exhibition on the ideas, the concepts, the thoughts, of a media philosopher, uh, Wil Wilhelm Flusser. There was nothing comparable like that before. Uh, Wilhelm Flusser uh, was uh, a very interesting thinker uh, from the 20th century who was born in Prague, uh, fled from the Nazis to London and then from London to Brazil and then he came back to Europe uh, and became one of the most influential thinkers uh, in media theory um, and in uh, media uh, concepts. Um, and he left uh, an enormous amount of manuscripts and of objects, of artifacts, uh, which uh, I was taking care for at the archive at the University of Arts in Berlin. Um, <coughs> this was uh, a view of the exhibition, but uh, I will not uh, bore you with that because of time reasons. Uh, two uh, machines were reconstructed um, in uh, purpose to make Flusser's thoughts and ideas more accessible. The first one was uh, the script, die Schrift uh, in German from 1987. This was uh, a, uh, an early e-book um, which was printed at the same time as a book and on one of these floppy disks we were just talking about. So at the end of the book you had this floppy disk and you could put it into your computer and then you could play with the text. This is what Flusser wanted. Um, also a text uh, from a philosopher should be operated on. It should not be something fixed, a fixed reality, but it should be operatable, uh, so to speak. And uh, this was not working anymore. Uh, it was very difficult to find the old machines, uh, and especially old machines which were perfectly still running, um, and then uh, to uh, correct uh, the corrupt uh, elements um, in uh, the program device we had uh, and uh, make it accessible again. Uh, we were very happy that uh, in the exhibition we could show this uh, e-book from 1986-87 uh, uh, in uh, 
in both forms uh, on, a, on one of these old uh, computers from the uh, end of the 80s and on a modern computer, of course. So you can see you can transform that easily into our computer reality. We did the same thing uh, with um, Flusser's hypertext from 1989. This was perhaps one of the first hypertexts um, which had been uh, produced by a philosopher. Uh, 89, this was in the context, uh, in the institutional context, of the old KIT uh, in Karlsruhe, which at that time was still the Institute for Nuclear Research, uh, very strongly affiliated with uh, the weapon industry. Uh, but this is another story. The whole ZKM is very strongly affiliated still with that because it's in an old building of a munition fabric factory. Um, Perhaps we will hear something about that later. Um, but uh, this is uh, the archive in Berlin uh, and how we started to work on the reconstruction of the hypertext um, for the practical reconstruction, um, a program helped a lot, uh, which we will hear uh, later more about, uh, the program which I initiated together with Peter Weibel, uh, which is called Archivists in Residence. Uh, Philipp Tögel, who was the first archivist in residence at the ZKM, helped us together with Dragon Aspensheet, who was here, I think, one month ago, uh, here at this museum, um, and uh, a, a wonderful uh, computer expert and uh, working with, with uh, heritage uh, material. Um, they helped us to repair uh, the hypertext uh, uh, device and again uh, the ambition was to uh, show, to let the hypertext run on a traditional computer from the time when it was produced from 1990 um, and uh, of course on, on uh, current uh, machines uh, so that you can use it also on your own uh, computer. Uh, just uh, to come to an end, um, I think uh, that uh, a lot of activities are necessary uh, to come uh, into terms with uh, the challenges uh, we are confronted with. Um, Selchuk uh, has mentioned that already several times. I think artists have a big responsibility uh, in cooperating uh, with uh, people who want to expose their work or perhaps uh, will be able to perceive it 50 years later or 100 years later. Uh, this is a very, very uh, big uh, effort because artists are not used uh, to make, uh, I don't know, documentations which are 30 pages long uh, to describe how a machine works. Uh, this is not their thing, <laughs> but they have to learn it more and more. This is also a field where new professions are coming up uh, between the arts and the technology and between the arts and the natural sciences. Um, perhaps here at Zabanchi it will be able to develop this kind of new professional perspectives. This would be extremely interesting. This is how um, a film archive by one of the most famous avant-garde experimental uh, filmmakers, experimental filmmakers from Great Britain uh, is looking like. This is David Larcher's film Depot um, in South Kensington in London. Uh, we took, I took that picture in 2013. You can see uh, it's moldy, it's moldy, it's getting rusty. Uh, David Larcher commented it with rusty, dusty, <laughs> and said, I can't take care of that. Uh, the only uh, possibility for him, uh, who is a poor artist, um, to, uh, to be taken care for his material would be that uh, an exhibition would, have, would be uh, uh, done for, for uh, with his work and then uh, the resources are generated uh, to make restorations of this material. For most of it it's already too late. Uh, you, can, you can say that or when, when I looked into the boxes I couldn't believe it uh, and David said oh, I don't mind. So when the film is shown in, in 20 years or so it looks completely different <laughs> than it uh, looked like when I made it but of course for the cultural heritage problem uh, this is a big problem. Um, David Larger's boxes where he keeps his uh, sound uh, tracks and, <laughs> and everything. They look like that. Uh, this is not an archive. This is a this is a container. This is a I call that unarchives. And uh, the artists' ateliers are full with these 
these unarchives, not organized at all, completely messy, um, and to make something out of that uh, which is useful for reconstruction is a real uh, challenge. And again, I think cooperations between universities, museums, artists can help um, to develop this culture further. Uh, I just give you at the end two examples uh, which I really admire a lot. Uh, First, uh, an old friend of mine, Werner Nekes, one of the most brilliant uh, filmmakers um, I know, who unfortunately died uh, last year, um, he built up uh, the most incredible private collection of technical artifacts uh, regarding optics. Um, this is uh, worth really many, many, many millions. No museum has this uh, rich uh, collections of, of devices, of optical devices, of books related to it. You can see here figures of the shadow theater from different countries, uh, someti sometimes going back for thousand years or 1200 years and, and even more. Um, he uh, not only collected this material, but uh, he did something extremely important, uh, starting around uh, the beginning of the uh, uh, new millennium, uh, he started to make films uh, about his collection, very precise, very pedagogical films. They were very much criticized. But uh, the advantage uh, which we have now is um, we have uh, the uh, description of the artist of this material um, and we can, with the help of his descriptions and the, the, the, um, the objects which he shows, um, we can reconstruct uh, this, not only the collection, but uh, a rich culture uh, behind uh, this collection. A similar project uh, which uh, I also used a lot to work with my students um, is uh, Jolie Godard's uh, Histoire du Cinéma. Um, this is a project, you will be familiar with this uh, film project, it was generated between 1989 and 1999 uh, by Jolie Godard uh, and it was his attempt to construct film history. But he did not write film history, but he used filmic apparatuses and video apparatuses to construct film history. Uh, this is uh, a little bit similar to uh, Knowlton, with whom I started. You use uh, the tools, the instruments and the aesthetic uh, implications of film technology to construct film history. A completely different form uh, in comparison or in opposite uh, to writing. Uh, I did that a lot uh, with my students. This was the early phase of media archaeology when I still taught in Berlin and, and in Salzburg. Um, we constructed a lot of usually shorter films uh, where we were dealing uh, with uh, specific artifacts, the film projector, specific parts of the film projector, the cameras, uh, all kinds of things, light uh, devices and so on, uh, to put them into the scene. The films are still existing, they are still running. Uh, you can easily use them as analytical tools, so to speak, uh, to reconstruct um, history. Um, I think uh, I should uh, stop here. Prospective uh, archaeologies, I hope uh, this has become clear a little bit, um, is not a nostalgic uh, activity. Uh, it's an activity which helps us to go through the layers of the past, sometimes very far back, um, to the presence and through the presence into possible uh, futures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the, uh, this fantastic speech. And we are going to have a Q&A uh, right now. Uh, Good. We have any question? No question. Oh. Hi, hello. Thank you for the presentation. It was really delightful. And um, my question is about the music devices and the rhythm, uh, mostly, actually. I'm really interested, I'm an art writer, but I'm really interested in uh, technology and synesthesia. I'm quite sure you might have heard of the uh, term before. Have you ever come across any um, 
manuscripts or say articles on synesthesia in the early uh, historical times because so far I've read, uh, well, done a little research on it and apparently um, one of the world-renowned artists, uh, Kandinsky, and mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. people from early 1800s, mm -hmm. uh, mostly painters and musicians, they mm -hmm. used to work together and try to implement the, the rhythmical devices right. onto their painting techniques and uh, in order to create or improve the technologies of color yeah. and yeah. realizing the rhythm within mm. the colors. Mm. Mm. I was just wondering if you have any no. information to share about this or not. No, I'm, I'm, uh, this it, research, I know this is a long this, subject, this, but it's just no, reminded me of No, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful subject, and this re research has to be done. I know that there are a lot of experiments going far back uh, with uh, sound image uh, relations. Uh, I would put it into this broader framework. Synesthetics uh, is a special case within sound image relationships because it's, uh, if you look at it pathologically, uh, yes. then it's really a very special case. But it's uh, more about the senses. But nowadays, yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. But in in previous uh, in previous uh, civilizations and ages, uh, uh, we did uh, not have so strong the hierarchy of the senses. Uh, you know, now we are used to the eye as the top. Uh, of the senses because the eye is connected with with reading with seeing things and so on so it's the the sense of knowledge uh, hearing is uh, already a little bit minor uh, and when it comes to taste and when it comes yes. to smell and so on the more it goes into inside of the body the less scientific it is <laughs> the less valuable Obviously, it is from yes. a knowledge aspect which is which is nonsense because now uh, we can see when we are going into the 21st century uh, uh, we will see that all these, uh, let's say, uh, horizontal organizations of the senses will come back again. Uh, the, the, the people who are working in uh, what I call artificial intelligence, um, they are discovering uh, the materiality uh, on which uh, the programs are running or have to run uh, more and more, uh, and uh, the issues of embodiment uh, becomes more and more important uh, in this artificial intelligence research. Uh, fields. Um, but um, yes, the, the body is coming strongly back because we have neglected it uh, for, for decorate for, for decades, for <laughs> centuries, uh, and now it, uh, like nature demands for more attention, <laughs> the bodies are demanding for more attention. It has a lot of aspects, gender aspects, uh, but also very existential aspects. Now, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that when you go back into the past where uh, this hierarchy was uh, not so strong working, um, you will find a lot of, uh, of examples. Uh, but I did not do this research, so I can't give you now a concrete hint and say, ah, you have to, <laughs> to look at that. But, uh, no, I but know. I was just wondering if you came uh, across anything uh, about no, it, because no, time is also rhythmical right. and yeah, yeah, absolutely, arithmetical, so absolutely. it's just... Absolutely. Of course, I mean, I, I worked a lot. In, uh, for, okay, give you one example. <laughs> but it will irritate you, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, there is a wonderful physicist uh, in Germany. Uh, he came from Poland, where I come from. Uh, he uh, named Ritter, R I T T E R. He lived around 1800. And he lived, uh, he developed an idea which uh, he was a, a physicist and a chemist. Uh, and very interested in, in electricity, and he developed uh, a cosmic uh, idea uh, of, uh, of reality, of nature, and he said there is nothing dead. Everything uh, is a question uh, of, uh, of swinging, uh, of, uh, how do you say, resonance, uh, of uh, uh, everything is alive. So he was one of the first life scientists, so to speak, because he did not accept the notion that dry material is dead. Um, is that every, when you look inside of the material, you can see it's living. There is a lot of life inside. And he uh, developed uh, also this, this uh, concept uh, that uh, regarding the relation between sound and images, uh, it's just uh, an issue of the frequencies, uh, how high or how low the frequencies are if something becomes a sound or if something becomes an image. Um, and with this kind of uh, world, he was playing a lot. This is 1800. This is around that time, which in Germany we call the Romantic uh, time, uh, where again the rediscovery of the body uh, and of uh, ideas of universality uh, played a very important role. Uh, this is just one hint. So I would uh, study Ritter. You will have a 
difficult time because his texts are <laughs> extremely difficult to read and they are practically only existing in German. Um, I have a translation project and I hope that we get some of that stuff uh, translated. But when you read my deep, deep time book, uh, you will find a chapter on him uh, and uh, on his ideas. Uh, and Walter Benjamin was completely fascinated uh, with yeah. this idea when he wrote uh, his uh, book on the German tragedy That's and so on, because it was the hope uh, to translate it now more into the current That's scene. Great. It was the hope, of course, through this idea um, to develop a language which is beyond letters, beyond uh, the limitations of a grammar, uh, a language which can only be expressed by physical material, through physical material. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. I'm always amazed by how you feel us this notion of freezing time, um, and question, more philosophical questions arise about the nowness and, and the um, um, the notion of um, chronological time. Um, the examples you have presented, including the the musical machines. They are, for me, from, from one perspective, is a replayable, recorded um, sense of time. I'm curious to hear how media archaeology would um, treat um, the experience of time when there is no chronological order, like in the case of, let's say, interactive art pieces, where indeed everything is surrounded and focused on oriented towards the experience of of non-periodical um, substance mm -hmm. um, how, how do you approach that no but I said you have to you have to do a completely different uh, research um, I used the example of the um, the symphony of sirens uh, from Avramov which you also can call an early interactive uh, piece it's a gigantic interaction between the city the urban space the musicians the people who were living in the city the director the composer was standing on the roof uh, of a house five floors high and was waving with flags and was directing <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, so uh, yeah, where do I know all this from? from? From reading critics, from reading, from going through archives and reading descriptions of this event. This, these are very often the only documents you can have. Uh, um, when, when, when it came to, to video art at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 1970s, um, the artists uh, had a tool uh, to document their work. I mean, this was very important for, for the feminist uh, tradition of, of video art, for example, Valley Export, uh, and uh, all these people who, who developed, all these women who developed their very risky performances, uh, their interactive uh, performances partly, um, they uh, documented them uh, with, with simple black and white technology, and so we know nowadays uh, vaguely how it, how it was. Uh, so you can research uh, in this kind of uh, trace, so to speak. But um, yes, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge for, for, for the kind of research you have to do. Um, the, I said the luckiest uh, situation you can have is that the artist himself or herself uh, uh, delivers you uh, a precise description of what he wanted to express or what she wanted to express uh, and how it was done. Uh, but this is very rare the case. But it's, it's becoming more and more culture. Artists have to learn that. I'm absolutely sure. I talked to Vadim Fishkin who works a lot with this thermodynamic. This was a very simple device but he works a lot with this thermodynamic uh, uh, field, so to speak, um, and uh, he just told me that he uh, um, had a request from a piece which he made in 2003 or something like that uh, from a Finnish uh, museum, a museum in Finland, um, and uh, they did not know how to handle uh, this piece. It was balloons uh, rising up and so on. Uh, and so uh, he wrote uh, a paper for them, 35 pages long, which he never did before, with a precise description of what they have to do. And then they are able to... to uh, and, and in this case, the objects were there. Uh, they did not need to, to build the objects. They just needed to build uh, the installation. Um, so uh, it, is, it is a very complex thing. And 
terms. The more it comes to radical time-based uh, constructions of art, the more difficult uh, it gets. And perhaps uh, in a few centuries only the texts will <laughs> remain uh, and uh, nothing else. And then you have to imagine uh, how it was, which is also not bad. This is how we started this project on Alas Automata. Uh, in many cases we simply had to imagine uh, how it might be or might have been. <laughs> <coughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Perhaps later more. I'm, I will be here okay. till later, so if, if there's so more questions rising. Okay, then. So thank you again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bir beş dakika ara verelim. Sonra devam ederiz.
So, uh, second part. Um, I get the pleasure uh, and the honor of the introducing our guest, uh, Daniel Heiss, software engineer, uh, Morgan Stricott, and sen senior media and digital art conservators, and Matthew Fleming, uh, and, uh, media and digital conservation from Zekame Castro. We'll talk on media archaeological reconstruction of media and digital artworks, practical case studies, where uh, they will reveal the results of uh, their research. Uh, please. I'm on, right? Okay. So, uh, first, I would like to thank to thank uh, everybody for this invitation. I'm really honored, and most of all honored to go to talk after Zygmunt Zelinski because I'm applying most of the concept he developed uh, earlier in my daily work. So, so I'm uh, Morgan Strikat, uh, Senior Media and Digital Art Conservator at ZKM, Center for Art um, and Media in Karlsruhe, uh, Germany, in the Wissen department. So it's uh, Wissen in German, it's knowledge. It's a department of collection, archives and uh, research. So we are taking care with my uh, colleagues Daniel Ice, software engineer, and Mathieu Vlaminck, a junior conservator, of the digital art and um, digital digital and media art collection of the ZKM, and especially the software, computer-based, and internet-based collection. So the ZKM collection includes approximately 8,000 works from the 20th and 21st centuries. In this collection has ZKM has collected and or produced about 120 uh, digital artworks with different uh, typologies, interactive and immersive installation, video sculpture, web-based, software-based, video-based, and so on. ZKM hosts uh, two museums, a media technology research institute called the Arts Lab, the Laboratory for Integrated Video System, and a media library. Today, I will also represent the PAMAL Group, which is a preservation and art media archaeology lab. We are a European artistic group composed of artists, media theorists, conservator wrestlers, and engineers, uh, developing media archaeologist um, artistic practice based on media archaeology practice of conservation and restoration of digital and media art. The PAMA group is creating its own works from um, digital artwork that have disappeared or been severely uh, damaged due to the obsolescence of computer software and hardware. Its work seeks to make visible the, vulnerab the vulnerability of an art form that is highly dependent on industrial heritage, uh, industrial logic. All the work that the collective reconstructs as close as possible to the original materialities, sometimes in a deficient uh, way, are treated as archives. So I will start this conference um, by presenting you the conceptual background on which ZCAM has developed its preservation strategy for digital and media artworks. And my two colleagues will present you practical cases um, afterwards. So due to, um, like everybody knows, obsolescence of software and hardware, digital and media artworks have compared to other forms of art uh, as a short uh, lifespan. In recent years, um, artworks, but also pioneering artists, have uh, begun to disappear, letting their precious archives and related knowledge dying with them. Often uh, based on a immaterialist conception of art, the conservation restoration of digital and media artworks has taken the name of preservation, focusing then on what immaterial is in the work, the material being then doomed to death, the care is focused on the source code. It is not only a question of keeping it as it is by renewing the data storage media, but also of preserving its readability despite the evolution of hardware and the piling up of software. To meet this challenge, the preservation method mainly proposed emulation, which makes it possible to read an obsolete uh, program with a current machine by simulating its original environment, Porting, which consists in rewriting the code to adapt it to a new digital environment, 
and reinterpretation, which consists in recreating the work. In all these cases, the code material original relationship is destroyed. Using the reproduci reproducible nature of computer files, um, sorry, I can't read. Using the reproducible nature of computer file and the possibility of obtaining significantly identical effects with different languages, the notion of original writing seems to have disappeared. This is the argument used for rewriting the code or reinterpreting it for preservation purposes. Because it is true that any program can be reduced to binary and in the end to differences in electrical voltages. And in this sense, in this sense no work is ever obsolete. But every artist, every digital artist, is first and foremost the explorer of his and her media. In this case, the code, the material and or the networks. The sensitive effects of the work result from a dialogue between the human and the machine, which is reflected by the very act of writing. Consequently, how can we, conservator wrestler, sneak inside the code and change it to fit a newer technological environment for which it was never meant for? There is nothing neutral about code or computer the artist used. They translate either how they envision future technologies or the influence of business model or political strategies of the industrial world on their productions. Any works of digital art is a writing whose possibilities are conditioned by the machines. In a computer, this condition corresponds to a stack of software, the lowest level of which allows the transition from symbolic to real. Ontologically, a digital writing, artistic or not, whether it is sound, image, text or gesture, is or all of this at the same time, is based on a succession of layers which not only makes it possible, but also gives it a meaning. However, the particularity of digital and media work is that it is highly dependent on the rules of industry that is applied to all layers. This is particularly true for network-based artworks. A digital work is then nothing more than the product of a relationship between the creation of an industrial world, that is an economic, a world, legal, techno-scientific and political, and an artist who came to explore its effects. So how can we overcome the logic of obsolescence without denying the materiality of digital artworks? Second original is one possible answer. Media archaeological reconstruction, or second original, is a concept born within PAMAL Group. Uh, it's defined as a duplication or a reconstruction of an artwork that has disappeared or is considered obsolete with its original writing and reading machines, so the hardware and the software. This reconstruction does not exclude either emulation or simulation, which can be used to recompose a particular part of the work. Daniel will explain more about this. This reconstruction can be considered at the end as an archive of the work itself. Its advantage is that it helps preserving the hard work as much as the industrial heritage. ZKM is applying this uh, complementary conservation strategy for its collection to promote the conservation of its collection in their um, in the artworks in their historical technological environments. Technology and code, like I said, are as a form of expression not neutral. Media archaeological reconstruction gives the public a unique chance to see concrete form of past media in action and conservators like us to experience the artworks conception. There's something important is that ZKM started collecting digital artworks in 1989 and during this period standardized approaches to managing digital art collections did not yet exist. So we had to work backwards, backwards and build a dedicated interdisciplinary team to take care of the 120 digital artworks of the collection. 
For the conservation, restoration and presentation of digital art pieces, ZKM is following a cross-disciplinary, cross-department model, which is the most effective model for a museum as expanding as ZKM with such a large collection. Two departments are sharing this responsibility, the Department Wissen, Collection, Archive and Research, and the Department Museum and Exhibition Technical Services. ZKM cross-disciplinary team, where we are all part, is composed of, a special, of specialists coming from the field of restoration, electrical engineering, computer science, art history, with really specific insights such as Mac Classic, SGI computers, or Linux programming. So like I said, ZKM promotes the conservation of its digital artworks in their historical, technological environment. This implies to keep as long as possible the artworks within their historical uh, software and hardware components. Not necessarily with the computer we acquired along with the artwork. It can be the same model or at least um, uh, from the same period compatible with the initial operating system. And to maintain old uh, artworks alive, we are um, basing our preservation strategy on the, the motto uh, lots of copies keep stuff safe from the, by the Stanford University Library and this concept of second original from the PAMA group. That means that we are always trying to accompany the artwork with a ready to run uh, spare computer and spare hardware and peripherals if needed, so mouse, cameras, uh, sensor screens. And instead of letting um, the backups onto our servers or magnetic tape, we additionally implement them on a spare computer in order to create um, multiple identical and functional examples of the whole hardware software environment. This is part of the preventive conservation strategy, coupling then the redundant data backup and the purchase of spares. So duplication, why? Why are we doing this? I think first of all it's important to say it's because we can, it's not something I'm saying like this, it's we, we have shelves and shelves of spare parts. And um, for computer, for CRT monitors, we have backup of operating system, plugins, drivers, libraries that we've been gathering since the opening of the ZKM in the 90s. Second, uh, since we are documenting early acquired artworks afterwards, this is actually the easiest way to gather missing information. Third, this allows us to act smoothly in case of a breakdown during exhibition because this avoids discovering unknown hardware specificities, incompatibilities and license key issues by actually testing the backups on their assigned equipment prior breakdown, which of course removes any kind of time pressure. Also by uh, duplicating, we do not have to make major changes of the software environment or peripherals and it then avoids any alteration of the artwork's behavior and outputs. Finally, and I think it's even more important, it gives the public the opportunity to experience the artwork as initially when it was created with its, with its uh, wear and tears, glitch and bugs. These artworks presented in this state are an entry point into software studies, media theory, media archaeology and so on. This is a way to experience the alternative practices used by artists to explore their media. This approach is also helpful for us, for ZKM workers and researchers. Since this artwork are repair or partially rebuilt with old spare parts, the tacit practical user knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. For example, how to install MS-DOS 5 with a floppy, how to boot an Amiga, how to repair an Apple II, how to operate a Commodore 64, how to hijack an IRIX license key, and so on. It could be said we have a really strong materialist approach. And we know for a fact that this decision is putting us sometime in really, really difficult situations. But this kind of historical curiosity is really motivated by our need to preserve not only artworks, but also knowledge. We are accidentally preserving the industrial heritage. Industry has never preoccupied by preserving its knowledge and use. 
So we created the technical and industrial museums. And they ended up with, I'm sorry, but dead inert machines and their showcases as example of our heritage. I would say it's plastic heritage. Because artists use those machines of their time to do something particular with it, the art museums are, again by accident, the only place where you can see them in action because they fulfill a purpose. So what happens if we are updating everything all the time? The theory of perpetual and contextual updating is a functionalist approach. Under the pretext of wanting to preserve the accessibility of the work, it becomes the discrete accomplice in the race for innovation and commercial profits. Contextual reconstruction aims at all costs to find the current equivalent of an older technology, both in its function and its concept. Thus eliminating all materiality and any notion of media technical environment. We are not trying to guess what the work, what the work would have looked or sound like if the artist, artists had access to contemporary technologies. As a conservator restaurant, is it not my role to conserve and restore our heritage for future generations? So it seems to me that perpetual contextual updating only creates new knowledge while burying old knowledge that we barely assimilated. But, <laughs> of course, we actually have to be pragmatic. And most of the time, this historical version of the artwork is only exhibited in-house for research purposes because of its high uh, fragility and dependency to industrial hegemony. So we need our facilities, skills, resources, spares and tools to install and furthermore maintain those artworks in exhibition. So at the same time, we are uh, preparing, like we are systematically preparing the works for migration to contemporary computer system and software um, at the same time. So we do not want to, preve to prevent other museums which might not have those resources to have access to our collection, neither the public. So for loan purposes and future exhibitions, we create updated version, the closest to the initial version within a newer technological environment for easier handling, installation and maintenance. This version is usually created with the help of the artist. You will see that with Mathieu. And it is very important while the historical version is still in working order. And if not, it will be repaired and if it doesn't exist anymore, it will be rebuilt from scratch with historical spare. And this is the topic of today. To create updated version of an art piece, no documentation can be more efficient than the initial work itself. We need this first-hand experience of how the artworks operate and looks and sounds like in its given historical technological context. This allows us to learn more about the artist's techniques and methods to hijack certain technologies' prior purposes. This experience is paramount to gather vanishing knowledge and compare the results of the updating process. So my colleagues are, gonna, are going now to present three practical cases. The first uh, practical, there's sound, we don't need sound on this one. <laughs> Um, this is virtual sculpture by Geoffrey Shaw, 1981. It's a pioneering augmented reality installation. The installation used Apple II computer uh, with its uh, game paddles attached to the monitor to register the tilt and uh, rotation movements. The projected images shown simple, slowly turning wire frame um, objects. On December 12, uh, 2018, Jeffrey Shaw offered ZKM the opportunity to acquire, as a donation, uh, five exclusive works spanning 52 years um, of what he's considering it as his milestone to ensure their longevity. Virtual sculpture no longer exists and must be reconstructed. We started then uh, a challenging media archaeological reconstruction of virtual sculpture with an Apple II computer. Uh, an historical reconstruction actually of this artwork is highlighting the innovative and pioneering aspect of this early augmented reality system. 
We also wanted with this case study to take the chance to gather more knowledge about this former technology and grow our network with the Apple II community in Europe. Many artists used Apple II technologies, as Chris Marker, for example, whose artworks are belonging to the Centre Pompidou in Paris. The reconstruction of this artwork is likely to be exemplary for the history of computer science in regard to digital artistic creation, as well as the study of the technical and technological possibilities developed by Apple and used by artists at this period. For example, uh, the reconstruction of Dialector, an early artificial, uh, artistic artificial intelligence created by Chris Marker in the late 1980s by the Poptronics Group research, uh, research Group, is a good example of the current enthusiast in the field. So this first practical case serves mostly research purposes. The second case study is a group of three artworks, uh, You Pigado with Watchdog, White Devil and Border Before from the late 80s and beginning of 90s, created by Paul Garin and uh, David Rockaby. The first two uh, artworks are groundbreaking interactive Lazardisk uh, video artworks, and the third is using Macintosh video tracking system. Uh, this project started in 2017 when ZKM initiated a general assessment of its collection to target especially early acquired artwork without documentation. Since ZKM did not establish conservation and, poli and management policies at the moment of acquisition, the crates of these artworks have remained in the depot for 10 years without being exhibited or restored. So the need for digital art conservation at that time was not even understood. You have to think about it. It was new technology, the hedge of the innovation. Nobody could imagine it will become obsolete or it could fail or disappear with time. So at that time, there were no such thing than backup or archival copies, dedicated computer or documentation strategies. So this artwork's software were stored on computers put it into storage for 10 years, and that's all. So the 16 craze of the free artworks has been opened in March 2018. A first inventory of the material has been done, and the computer has been inspected. Of course, all Macintosh hard drives were obviously badly damaged by this long storage. Computers' CMOS batteries leaked onto CPUs of the Amiga's computer. Data were completely lost. According to our first assessment, a full reconstruction of the artworks was necessary. The lack of documentation on those artworks was absolutely dramatic. We had 16 crates of equipment without any wiring diagram or any behavior documentation. The easiest and fastest way for us to understand the work was to just set it up as original and get it working. So. Of course, we could have reconstructed these artworks with the help of Paul Garin, as well as new technology to do exactly the same in a hand-sized computer. And I'm not saying that to solve some of the transition to contemporary media, we may in some cases need to emulate our, uh, the behavior of the legacy environment. But even though Paul Garin sent us clips where we can see the quirky behavior of the Lazarus playback, we couldn't reconstruct it from scratch if we didn't experience it first. So we decided to do a media archaeological reconstruction of the free artworks. We just finished a one-year research project with Paul, with whom, which without whom a reconstruction wouldn't have been possible. And the whole reconstruction step by step of the artwork was precisely documented and the final reconstruction considered as an archive allowing us, restorers and technicians, to understand the work and undertake restoration. Without this reconstruction, some paramount information would have been lost. Because afterward, we realized that the transition to contemporary media would have been at high risk to lose the character of this unprecedented system. In indeed, these three artworks are retrospectively paramount for the history of interactive video art. David Rockaby, the engineer who worked with Paul Garin, created and designed custom-made software and hardware to bend the technology to do what the industrial world wouldn't offer at that time. The technology didn't exist, so they created it. How artists envision future technologies 
is what we intend to explore with this case study. So Mathieu will uh, give some insight on this project. Uh, this uh, then second uh, reconstruction project led then to a better understanding and therefore better documenting and therefore better updating of these artworks, but also to real technological discoveries of the past. Finally, Daniel Ice uh, will present the third uh, case study, Wipe Cycle and uh, Track Trace from uh, Frank Gillette and Ira Schneider and Track Trace only from Frank Gillette. So in the course of the preparation of our exhibition, uh, Radical Software, the Rain Dance Foundation, Media Ecology and Video Arts at ZKM, we were again confronted with the task to reconstruct two historical video artworks uh, only on the basis of documentation, uh, like textual description, drawing, videos, and memories of the artists themselves. To resurrect this work as close as possible to the original version, we developed a tool chain of universally applicable modules based on easy accessible hardware and open source software to close the gap between analog video things like TVs and modern video sources like digital cameras and digital video playback devices. We implement tasks like time shift of video on video feeds, programmable switching between video signal, on the fly image processing and video wall signal distribution. With this set of modular combi combinable entities, it is possible now to imitate many of the concepts and effects that were used in video art during the last century. So this last reconstruction project aim as uh, facilitating the exhibition and access to video artworks and creating a general method for a transition from analog to digital. So I will let now my colleague Mathieu give you the real technical insights. So only technique now. <laughs> um, so hello. I'm Mathieu Lamink. I'm a junior media art and uh, digital art conservator. Uh, that's my actually first international conference, so I'm very honored to be here and I would like to thank personally everyone involved. Um, so the first project I will uh, talk about is a virtual sculpture from uh, Jeffrey Shaw. So for a bit of background, in the late uh, 70s, Jeffrey Shaw and his event structure research group partner Theo Botschuer embarked on a series of computer graphic and augmented reality experiments that were inspired by two technologies. So the first one on the left, uh, it's an age-old illusion technique called Pepper's Ghost that dates back to the 16th century. Uh, that's a technique that uses a see-through mirror to create a ghost image that seemingly floats in space. The second on the right, uh, it's a pioneering virtual reality head mounted display, or HMD, invented by Jan Sutherland in 1968, which he called the Sword of Damocles. Their uh, first artwork that resulted from their joint research was called uh, Virtual Sculpture in 1981. The optical method based on Pepper's Ghost is updated in virtual sculpture by using a video image and a Fresnel lens to change the focal length so that the image appears some meters away when viewed through the semi-transparent mirror. The systems rotate and tilt function then allow these virtual images to be physically disturbed all around the viewer. So it was really an interactive artwork. Um, it was using an Apple II computer to create the 3D wire from graphic imagery, a tripod mounted CRT monitor fitted with a Fresnel lens and a see-through mirror. An interactive design using Apple II game paddles uh, attached to the monitor to register the tilt and rotation movements allowed the viewer to move it. They could then discover animated computer generated virtual objects floating around, floating uh, about different locations in the physical exhibition space. These artful apparatus prefigured the uh, augmented reality uh, that were introduced into the market uh, some 20 years later and which are currently, of course, uh, a fast developing industry. Unfortunately, the, the original version, this one called Megveld, no longer exists. All we had now was an inventory number, some information and 
the artist's mind. So for the reconstruction, uh, we bought an Apple II Plus on eBay. But there was uh, one problem, actually. It arrived damaged and non-functional. It was coming from the USA, so that was a long trip. <laughs> so what could I do to repair it? Because uh, actually, this technology is, was done before I was born. I'm only 28. Um, but fortunately, it came with all the manuals. And uh, at that time, um, Apple has included, unlike today actually, all the schematics and documentation about the operation and maintenance of the machine. So I just had to read it and make a beautiful board. <laughs> In one day, I studied all the motherboard working and I knew how it was functioning. Um, so I checked first um, which part were damaged on the motherboard. So there were 10 computer chips, including RAM memory, that you can see on the orange sticks on the right. Um, there was a slot contact on the top that became rusty, actually. So I cleaned them one by one. But unfortunately, the two uh, video uh, chips here were too much damaged and not repairable. So we had to order a second and malfunctioning also Apple II Plus, but not the same way. So I managed actually to take the two video chips, put them on the first one, and I have a fully uh, functional device. For the software, uh, Jeffrey Shaw and Larry Abel used a niche one. So it was only known by an informed public at the time. It was called the Sublogic A2 3D1 Animation Library. So for a bit of uh, Wikipedia information, Sublogic Corporation, uh, it's an American software development company that was formed in 1975 by Bruce Hartwick while he was attending at the University of Illinois. Um, they created actually the infamous flight simulator game. That was a screenshot of the first version in uh, 1980. Uh, the company also produced software uh, like children's educational software, the 3D graphic uh, library, and also video cards, and 3D graphic software for PC. So the next step was to source, install, and learn this library to be able to uh, recreate the artwork. And we had no cassettes, disk, or data available. But by happy chance, Bruce Hartwick himself uh, uploaded on archive.org what he said, a scan of a photocopy of a manual for the sublogic uh, routines that you can see here. So it's not very good quality, but it was readable. And also, according to him, this manual contains enough to be able to use the program as the software is pretty unusable without this documentation. And I soon discovered that it was the case. Uh, the manual is 92 pages of pure mathematics. So one could expect that you have to know a bit of uh, mathematics to do uh, 3D stuff. <laughs> but today's software, as I learned, um, is, uh, it's helping you a lot, actually, to do that. But given the Apple II's age, you simply cannot have this kind of help. So you need to have some uh, advanced space mathematics knowledge. And um, everything is needed to be pro programmed line by line in assembly language. So for those who don't know what it is, assembly language is a low-level programming, uh, one designed to, uh, for a specific type of processor. You had to wake up early to do this type of programming, as writing assembly language is a tedious process, since each of the operation must be performed at a very basic level. While it may not be necessary to use assembly code to create a computer program today, learning assembly language is often part of a computer science curriculum since it provides useful insights into the way a processor works. And I was really glad I got this training. So then to implement the written application, we could use either the original uh, floppy drives, so the two here, the first one containing the uh, operating system and the second one 
uh, containing the software. So that's five and a quarter inch old uh, floppies. Or also we could use this floppy emulator here, which uses a micro SD card, which is more reliable today because they tend to not age well those, but that's less uh, Apple II aesthetic. Uh, we also bought, uh, as you can see here, the two uh, game paddles. So you have the, the tilt and pan uh, to be able to test, of course, uh, the software. So while this artwork has recently entered ZCam's collection, uh, Jeffrey Shaw created an updated version of the disappeared artwork. The reconstruction of the CRT monitor, Fresnel lens, and the see-through mirror and tripod assembly are faithful to the original as possible. Similarly, the appearance of the animated computer graphic images, so the simple low resolution wireframe objects, uh, were also replicated, but this time using a more modern PC and software rather than the old uh, Apple II and the obsolete sublogic library. So that's the first project. The second one, um, so Paul Garin, uh, for a bit of background, is uh, part of a second generation of American video artists whose work combines masterful technological innovation with pungent social critique. Garin, who began working with the video while at the Cooper Union School of Art in New York, was an assistant and collaborator of Nanjun Pike, uh, beginning in 1981. Uh, yeah, we'll try to see if it's okay. Yeah, I will first explain you Pigeto with Watchdog and then show you a bit because there's the. Maybe we could turn off the light. Turn lights a bit. Yeah, that's the three videos. Um, that we had at first. So Yupigeto with Watchdog consists of a, a video mural that you can see here uh, showing a swan cocktail party. So you can see the guest in formal wear chatting pleasantly and toasting in on posts. Uh, the party goer seems oblivious to the scene of war and carnage that flashed outside the, the window. And this interior was protected by a wall of cement blocks, a chain link fence, razor wire, and a German shepherd, or rather a video of a German shepherd. Um, and as visitor approached the, the gate, uh, the dog was starting to bark at them, to snarl and snap his jaws. So I'll show you a bit. So you can see the dog here, that's the fence, and you have the party video on the background. Yes, here it is. <laughs> and you could do graffitis actually on the wall, there were spray cans. So that's it. So that's Yupi The uh, second one, White Devil, uh, is a bit more complicated than this one, technically. Um, so you have also a video mural that showed a large estate, uh, complete with manicured lawn and a handsome car, parked flamboyantly in the drive, and the rest was burning to the ground. Before it, you had a pit made of uh, video monitors that contained a white pit bull that was following the visitors along and barking at them. So, um, I think that's gonna work directly. No, yes. So you have a bit of showing also of the technical side of uh, White Devil. Yeah, that was the only documentation we had, a bad quality of video.
That's actually the 92 version. Some of the uh, hardware included in the computer were different um, at ZKM. So you can see the dock. So that was not easy to make a video because it was really in the dark, so, yeah. So uh, UPGetto and Wine Devil uh, were both using uh, serial control laser disc players that can do an instant jump cut uh, to any clip of the dogs within plus or minus 100 frames. Uh, White Devil, as you saw, is more complex uh, because the laser disc player were mounted as a pair, coupled with time-based uh, correctors. The jump between active and queuing pair of laser disc player are indistinguishable. The dogs move smoothly and follow the visitor through the 12 monitors. For both hard work, uh, David Rockaby's very nervous system can track a person's movement in a large space. A video camera sends images to a computer that analyzes consecutive frames to detect motion and presence. Using custom-made electronics and software, Rockaby's system allows to display different set of clips according to the visitor's position within a zone. So the very nervous system was used again in a Border Patrol. And I will talk first about uh, the piece uh, is made up of a wall topped with a razor wire, multiple embedded screen on the front. You have four robotic cameras uh, that are mounted on the wall and they are paired with a secondary stationary tracking camera. They function as visual sensor to the VNS interface that control the positioning of robotic cameras to follow people as precisely as possible. The robotic cameras are very fast and have very long imposing lenses of them. Spookily, as the camera follows the visitors, they are always looking directly down the barrel of the lenses. The images from the robotic cameras are displayed on the embedded screens, and when the system has locked onto the, uh, a head, a crosshair will form, and the sound of a submachine gun fire will rip out the hefty subwoofers behind the wall. Each of the four cameras can track up to 32 individual objects and monitor their status. So that was quite awesome for the time. So that's the... So you have the monitors, you can see a bit of hardware here. The Amiga computers, we'll talk about that later. And you have the robotic camera for filming the people. So they are mounted to really powerful stepper motors to, f to be able to follow. And you can see, yeah, that's the stationary camera for detection. And this one is for the, the display. So for those three artworks, there were never any documentation made. Uh, all we found actually was uh, some uh, paper notes on the crates made by Paul himself. And uh, the setup was done uh, by him each time it was exhibited. So after doing a full inventory of what we had, we began to clean the reading head of the Laserdisc player and uh, also the Macintosh computers before starting the tests. The first problem was with the uh, UP Ghetto Macintosh computer. So that's a Macintosh Quadra 605 
from the beginning of uh, 1993. Uh, it was not powering on. So simple problem, simple solution. I just changed the power supply here. Uh, but there was another problem. The fan was spinning, but I had no sound or display, nothing at all. I've done some researches and I found that on those generation of computers, the CMOS battery that you can see here, uh, if it's depleted, actually the computer is not booting at all. So also simple problem, simple solution. We had a spare one, I changed it. It was still not booting. So I've done some more thorough search on the motherboard and uh, two of those capacitors here were uh, damaged. So I managed to take out two other from a non-working motherboard, but the capacitors were okay, and I replaced them, and the Macintosh was finally booting. But there was a third problem. The hard drive actually was not recognized by the Macintosh boot manager. Um, I tried to do a backup of the data with the working station computer to see, but the hard drive was not detected at all, nothing and uh, we thought that it was badly damaged by uh, long storage, and we were right. We've done a bit of a background check, and we found out that the Quantum brand hard drive that Apple was using on those computers, they were really, really bad, actually. Uh, they fell too quickly. The other problem is that we didn't have any backup of this computer, so for now, all data was lost. I tried everything I could, uh, even to freeze the hard drive for 24 hours to try to unlock the mechanism inside because that can be due to that sometimes without success. So I decided then to open it in safe space. Video, the picture was took after. <laughs> to see if I could unlock the mechanism uh, and I found two problems inside. First, the rubber which is supposed to hold, that's the reading head of the hard drive, and it goes this part to bump uh, inside. Here there's a rubber normally. Uh, it's supposed to damp the, the, the, the head, so it had melted over time because it was really bad quality rubber. Uh, and it became completely gooey, so I had to clean uh, all of it. I managed to replace it. Then the head was working again, but the second problem ended all. Actually, the hard drive was completely demagnetized. There were no data on it. So um, normally, the hard drives that don't come into contact with a degausser or strong magnetic fields, of course, or very large uh, temperature variations, uh, they should demagnetize after 40 years at least. So, yeah, all was lost with this drive. So the only thing I could do uh, was just to uh, put another compatible hard drive to reinstall the uh, operating system with the still working macOS original floppies and after replacing the floppy drive that was also out of order. <laughs> so basically on this Macintosh, all that was working uh, was the speaker and the fan. Um, fortunately, a bit later, Paul Garin uh, found out the backup he had of the software, so he managed to send that to us, and I could easily uh, implement it back onto the new hard drive, as the software itself is just self-contained. That was just basically copy-past. So we were a bit relieved. Uh, we tested the equipment and setup of uh, UP Ghetto in May 2019, but without documentation, we couldn't calibrate the software and it was not behaving uh, properly. So we done it again with Paul himself uh, last month in November. And this time we managed with Morgan to make an extensive documentation of the software content, components, behavior, calibration, and to complete our wiring diagram and documentation of the, docu the communication between computers, laser disk, everything. We asked a million of questions to Paul. Um, so White Devil operate the same way as uh, UP Ghetto, but this time uh, using six laser disks players. 
that are paired together. Uh, the, Paul used actually the Sony LDP-1550 laser disc, especially because at the time it was the only one that could do serial communication to be able to do the, the, the jump cuts. S and there was also, we don't see much there, three time-based correctors that were also plugged and synchronized to the laser disc player uh, to be able to smooth the animation more. Uh, between the pairs of laser discs, because you still had some jump cuts, of course, with all those uh, tech. Uh, the Macintosh was the same as Upigeto. It was using the same uh, Intact 4 software, that's the name of the software, that was uh, created by Rockabye. So that's really a custom software for the artwork. It was a, a good thing, as the hard drive on this one was also out of order. This program is used to define the eight motion zones that you can see here. So each time you set up the artwork, actually, you have the camera feedback and you can draw the motion zones to, to be able to detect the presence of the, of the visitors. And these zones are linked to a, a matrix that contains actually uh, the information where the clips are stored on the laser disc to be able to play the right uh, tracking of the tracking clip of the dog. So again, Paul Garin had a, a, a copy of the software, sent it to us, and I implemented it back on a new hard drive. That was easier since I had the experience of uh, UPGETO. So we done first test in October 2019. With, um, we had all the laser disc player that have been checked. Five of them were in working order, but a bit unstable. And we had one that was also completely out of order, so we had to take one from UPGETO to replace it, as we had no spare parts at all. This was considered enough, according to the tight schedule, to make a proper test setup with uh, Paul a month later. So for the sake of this setup, uh, we used only uh, three monitors instead of the 12. So we didn't plug the video uh, wall monitor, so it was simpler. And we attached the camera to the wall instead of the ceiling because the ceiling was already busy with a uh, UP ghetto. Um, we used the original exhibition's laser discs to, to display the dog. And uh, everything was working after two days of work. Just aside of some, we still had a lot of jump cuts because of the laser disc player age. So that was still a problem but it was basically working. Um, so that will lead to our next uh, challenge, which is the transfer of the laser disks. As of today, we cannot do copies of them anymore. That's why we use the exhibition uh, ones. We are now looking uh, into a way of not only digitize them, but completely imagine them because we could uh, very easy to lose the character of the work by simply capturing to digital. We need to be creative on how we solve the transition to contemporary media in order to retain the original integrity. We may in some cases need to emulate the behavior of the legacy hardware. So the cue point of each predefined clip, as I explained before, of the dogs uh, for UPGETO and White Devil are contained in the, into the data of the computer. That's the software who defines that. And this code is carried over the, um, the, the laser disk, actually. It uses reference that you can see on the laser disk, you have those parts who are storing like the frame codes, how the laser disk is organized. That's a bit like a hard drive when you have uh, the boot partition and the, the, the partition map, actually, to tell where the data is. It's the same principle. Um, so we have to capture that too, because the only uh, digitization we had was actually just a video transfer, so that's just a video file. And uh, if we cannot carry those codes, we had to cut manually everything, and that's going to be a really, really long work. But as of now, we don't know if there is a way to, to digitize the laser this, this way by keeping the frame codes. So if you know someone, we will be really interested. <laughs> uh, 
um, we turned that into a small uh, research project um, to systematically consider a system for the digitizing the laser disc, including time codes. Uh, this goes along with the desire to develop a laser disc emulator to replace the aging ones, since they are not building them anymore, with, uh, for example, a Raspberry Pi. If we obtain the time codes of the frame, we could hopefully reconstruct the transition graph somehow from the code and also simply substitute the laser disc player on in the installation without having to interfere in the work. We found a manual, which is called Build an Interactive Video Disc Controller with PC. I really like the jacket. Um, this one can be interesting to us uh, because, uh, for example, on the book it's explained that every still captures on a video disc as a unique frame number. So it's going from 1 to 54,000. And using this number, the player control system can identify and search for any one of the 54 thousand and display it. So that was the uh, beginning of a lead of how it's really working inside the laser disk. So as I said before, Border Patrol is the most complicated of the three artworks. Surprisingly, the Macintosh LC475 was in a really good shape. It was working better than the two other Quadra 605 and the hard drive was still working, but it was showing signs of uh, fatigue. So I made directly a backup of it and transferred onto a new fully working hard drive. The first uh, difficulties with this artwork came with the four Amiga 2000 computers. They are the ones actually that are responsible to show the target display that you saw before. Um, you have to know they were stored in their own foam padded fly <laughs> cases and the badly degraded foam created a, a toxic dust layer that was really nasty on all of the Amigas, all inside. So we had to carefully uh, clean it and that took a lot of time. Um, also, Another bigger problem was uh, the CMOS batteries inside. They were soldered to the motherboard, so they couldn't remove them. And with the time, there was like acid leak damage on all the four of them. It was a different kind of uh, damage that was going from just small um, acid going on the virgin part of the PCB here to the most damaged one, which was going on the, that's the CPU of the Amiga, by the way. So really not a good thing. So I cleaned uh, all the acid, I managed to replace the CMOS battery. For this one, I had to remove all the housing here and I resoldered the CPU, but uh, still not working, this one. Uh, also, yeah, we had, Another problem, two of the four power supplies of the Amigas were completely uh, out of order. And also, all but one hard drive were working. And there was also quantum hard drives, by the way. Um, but there was nevertheless enough for me to be able to rebuild two fully working Amigas out of the four because you don't need to have all the four workings for the test because Border Patrol is working with uh, two parallel systems. So if you have only half of it, you can do the, the, the first test. Uh, we manage, yeah. <laughs> I had to wear a mask with all the dust and acid stuff. And um, we managed so to have Border Patrol test set up so you can see like the Aurora cameras here, we have the two Amiga computers, Macintosh. Uh, it worked for five minutes <laughs> before uh, having actually some technical difficulties because that's all US power. And uh, we learn actually that not only uh, there's the power conversion, the volt conversion, but there's also a frequency conversion. And this, yeah, when the box, uh, which one is it? It's this one. 
was starting to smelling burn, and I think it was not, because that's a custom box, and I think it was really designed for the, this type of frequency. But as Paul said to us after that, it's just low tech solving now. Yeah. So that's all for me. Daniel. Uh -huh. yeah, no, wait. My name is Daniel Heiss, and I too work for ZKM. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, I have to say too. Um, I work as a software developer in ZKM, and in contrast to Morgan and Mathieu, I work for the other department, which takes care for the exhibition part. We prepare the exhibitions and uh, are mostly uh, working on maintaining the currently running exhibitions. And from time to time, I also work with you guys. So we are one family at ZKM. Today, I want to uh, speak to you about the work that I did on the reconstruction of the installation's wipe cycle and uh, track trace, wipe cycle by Ira Schneider and Frank Gillette, and track trace by Frank Gillette only, um, especially wipe cycle can be considered groundbreaking in video art, so that's why it was a really honor to work on it, because it was the first ever uh, multi-channel video installation in the history, at least that I know of. Um, so on the left you see wipe cycle. How does this work? Ah, okay. um, it consists of nine monitors, three by three um, matrix um, where different content will be displayed in a choreography which is switching. Um, there is a camera image, the camera is on top here, um, you see a live camera image switching here, alternating with a TV program, then you have a delayed camera image on the corners which is eight seconds delay and 16 seconds delay, those two change regularly, and on the middle ones you have a, a pre-recorded video that is um, played in an endless loop. On the other work, track trace, it's uh, from the same guy, so it's also using delay, and uh, in this case it's also using a space uh, different perspectives. Um, the, the, the space in front of this pyramid is recorded by three cameras on the corners here and here and one on top. So uh, first thing is that the cameras switch. So there's always one active camera which changes regularly every se three seconds and then there is uh, four different, five different uh, time um, layers which is uh, the live image of one, the active camera on top, and then it always gets four seconds delayed. So four seconds here, eight seconds here, 12 seconds, 16 seconds in the past. So you see yourself in different time layers and uh, from different perspectives in many different uh, screens. So uh, it's always the same image on one row. So it's actually five different signals. So this was already quite technical, but um, I, I perhaps before I get too much in the other technical stuff, uh, this was the, the occasion why we did this work was uh, this exhibition in 2017, uh, the ZKM prepared the exhibition Radical Software, the Rainlands Foundation Media Ecology and Video Art 
was created by George Baker, um, Judith Beer, and Margit Rosen. Um, the exhibition presented video works and installations of pioneering group of American artists and scientists uh, who called themselves the Raindance Foundation. They were using medium video, the medium video as a tool for new artistic expression, as a new form of communication. It was the wish of the curatorial team to include these two artworks I showed you before in the exhibition. So um, there was only one problem. Both artworks were not existing, so at least not in a physical form. They have been shown at this uh, point uh, in 1969 and 72, and not really afterwards. I'll tell you more about that later. This is not really surprising because from a conservational point of view, um, these early video artworks differ a bit from the newer computer-based media art installations that Mathieu described in his work, in his lecture. In, in contrast to computer art, based uh, computer-based art, um, where the computer and the software are often an integral um, part of the work, so it's uh, mostly attributed to the work. Uh, in video art, the used equipment was rarely uh, kept with the work itself. Most of the time, uh, the period for which these video artworks were created was only limited to days or weeks for special occasions like galleries, shows, or a festival or something like this. And so afterwards they dismantled the video work and um, the equipment which was used went back to where it came from. It was borrowed or, or rented and rarely it was the artist who owned all the equipment because it was simply too expensive. Um, so you could say video art was more kind of a festival art made for special occasions but not yet for the museum or for collectors. Of course there are exceptions such as the installations by Pike who painted sometimes directly on the TV or, or used the, the, the electronic stuff as a part of his sculptures so as he, he turned it into a sculpture. But one can say that is rather an exception in this time. Um, okay, so for us it became clear we had to reconstruct wipe cycle and uh, track trace from scratch. So there was only documentation on how it was made, but we didn't have any hardware or anything else. So I will show you a short video of... No? Come on. So this is a video of the original. No, why does it not work? <laughs> oh no, it was working before. It worked on my computer. Um, okay, so now I can show you the original setup of Wipe Cycle in the Howard Stern Gallery, uh, Howard Weiss Gallery, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, this uh, is not really, um, it's not bad because we have something like this. Actually, this is even better because if you see the video, you would say, um, okay, I don't really get what's happening here because it's a bit confusing if you see all the programs switching around in a very, it, at first it looks like a bit of random uh, pattern, uh, but then there is something like this. It's uh, the the uh, drawing that was made by Frank Gillette and Ira Schneider for the first issue of the newsletter Radical Software, which was published by the Rainlands Foundation, where they described their work and. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best examples for good, clear documentation of a work where you have everything on one side. It's all there, what you need to uh, reconstruct the work from a functional point of view. So you know what it's doing. You still don't know how it is made, but you, you get what it is doing. So here again, you can see it's uh, 
alternating programs in the middle live means the live camera. It changes every four seconds with the broadcast TV back and forth. On the uh, corners, you have on this screen and this screen, it's always doubles. Eight second delay, eight second delay, which exchanges with the other corners on this and this one, 16 seconds delay from the live camera. So, and on the middle ones, you have videos, pre-recorded stuff, this and this the same, and this and this the same, which also exchanges at another rate, I think four seconds. So there is the rest of the description that you need to fully get what this thing is doing. Um, we had the luck to, uh, Ira Schneider and Frank Ginette, Fr Frank Gillette are still alive, of course, um, and Ira Schneider lives in Berlin for 20 years now, so we were in close contact with him for the exhibition preparations. He also donated his archive, video archive to ZKM. And so it was easy for us to talk to him and ask questions. And uh, when we asked him how the switching was done and stuff like this, we had him on the phone. He said, oh, uh, no problem. I sent you a, I sent you a drawing. Um, then you will get it. And this is what he sent. <laughs> um, it's a bit confusing. And, uh, but you can get some, some uh, something from it. So here he describes how the delay was made. It was three tape recorders, these open reel um, tape recorders that were, or, or no, it was one tape recorder and two tape players, let's say. And uh, they were connected uh, to the camera on top of the t thing. So the tape recorder recorded the live camera signal and the information recorded onto the tape went slowly through the room, uh, through space, and to the next uh, station where it was then played back. So the time it took for the tape to go from this to that was the delay that you would later see on, this, on the camera signal. So it was two of them, one for the eight second delay and one for the 16 second delay. This, is, uh, this shows how it uh, was, how they used uh, curtain rollers somehow. I don't know uh, how they did it, but it was really messy. What we know is that they uh, never could leave the work alone in the gallery, so they had constantly to stay next to it because it crashed every two hours or even worse. This thing here is more interesting because um, I, I didn't get it in the first place. I thought this is some kind of uh, a belt that's going around and he couldn't really explain it to me. Um, later it became clear, so actually this here is a motor and there's a rod attached to the motor and this spins in this way and there are screws on the rod and uh, it's for making electrical trigger impulses in a, diff in a certain uh, period. So this is the actual software of Vibe Cycle was done in a mechanical way by uh, rotating screws that touched to uh, metal parts in a certain speed. So um, first we tried to transfer this drawing into a more uh, understandable uh, scheme. So here again, you can see his camera, the, th the delay part. Um, what he didn't mention in his drawing, so of course there was uh, the, the playback for the pre-recorded material, so two uh, videotape players. And one interesting detail is we never thought about it until we, um, how, how do you playback videotape in an endless loop? So um, it's two reels, you have it first on the one reel and then you play it back to the other reel and then it's there and you have to rewind or, or if you play it uh, the other way it just runs backwards so that's not um, what you want. And uh, it was 1969 that they built this, later there were devices that could do this, so special cartridges which uh, had this included so you could put it on the tape recorder and now you had a 10 minute endless loop. Um, but 
to this time they didn't have it, so and uh, then it um, turned out they just didn't loop. They had a special um, device which just detected when the uh, movie was finished and then it played back, it rewinded, rewound automatically and started the playback again. So there was always this short break when the rewind was t uh, taking place. This was n uh, not documented anywhere, so this was something we had to find out on our own. Um, you see, everything is connected to the switch box, and this was, till we really thought about it, it was simply not clear how this worked. So um, we had this vague descriptions of the artists, and uh, the problem was that um, they didn't do it on their own. This is something we learned in this process by asking questions too. They had a TV, te TV technician who, who uh, built this device for them. So um, they didn't know themselves how it really worked. So we tried to find a solution how it could have worked. So um, it was a mixture of mechanical parts through this rotating and the um, relay. Uh, some some some relay electronic parts. So you see here is two switches which symbolize the contacts that touched were touched by the screws. Those triggered flip flops, toggle flip flops. So if they get an impulse, like you see here, they change the state. They get active or passive with every other impulse. They just change the state, and uh, so they could do this signal switching of the um, video signals that landed on the TV. What I didn't mention so far is there was a th uh, uh, another component which gave actually the name to this installation, the wipe cycle. The wipe cycle is just a black image which travels around the outer TVs in a loop. So it was uh, erasing one by one the, the uh, content of the display. And this was um, done by, so you couldn't uh, just uh, think about, because it was the same signal on the uh, corners and the same signal on this one, but the uh, wipe cycle was only on one screen all the time. So you had to um, add another eight relays which could turn off the, the corresponding TV one by one. Um, so this is what we came up with and uh, everybody I showed this so far agreed so it could work like this. The only part is this, uh, I, I didn't uh, include it in the scheme. You need another uh, IC or a switch register which uh, triggers with every impulse, it just goes one um, further to the next input. Um, that, I hope this works. Why not? I show you this on another. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it again, maybe. Or oh, maybe I can play it back from here. No. So we, we just created a 3D simulation of, of this uh, thing that was the mechanical part to, to, to uh, get a, an, an understanding how it should have worked. Okay, so uh, anyways, I, I will show it to people who are interested afterwards. Um, it was this, uh, just, it was really simple. So one screw for the eight second delay, which traveled around 600, uh, 360 degrees for one impulse. Then there were on top, there were two screws in 180 degrees uh, configuration. So this was the half of the pulse. So every four second it touched the, the contact and then there was a two second uh, impulse thing with four screws. And so you had this f uh, three um, 
different time levels, which um, uh, which just did this cold choreography on on the work. So. Um, Actually, it was not true that it didn't exist since 1969. There were two other reconstructions made with Wipe Cycle for an event at the uh, Kölnischer Kunstverein and the Berliner Kongresshalle, both in 1989, done by Dieter Selin. The funny thing is, Dieter Selin is uh, working now at the HFG, which is right next to ZKM. And so also we could contact him, how he did these reconstructions. And uh, all he said about it was, it was terrible. It, uh, so uh, he, he tried to do the same what they did back then with a VHS tape, video uh, cassette tape, and uh, had the same problems, of course, like uh, back then. So it uh, just went, worked for a few minutes or hours and then it just crashed again. So this was not an option for us to go the same road. So um, what else we got from IRA was this um, digital wipe cycle software. It was done by a, a student in, from the TU Berlin. It was a Java program that he gave us which uh, actually emulated this uh, wipe cycle behavior on one screen but you could uh, adjust it so you could uh, use nine computers and uh, let them communicate over network and then it would do more or less the same like WipeCycle did. We tried this uh, software and quickly realized it's the switching was really digital, so it looked not really good. There were sometimes there were uh, uh, glitches digital glitches in, in the camera image. You had to use a USB camera because the software was only thought to use USB camera. And um, so before we started to uh, rewrite this code that the student wrote, we thought, okay, no, we go a different road. We just do it all on our own from scratch. We um, start this our way. So this is what I came up with as a setup for the um, new version of Wipe Cycle. It's, um, six Raspberry Pis. They are uh, all connected over Ethernet and um, there is a networked camera. It's an IP camera that you can connect with uh, Ethernet. This, at first this sounds a bit, no, this doesn't fit right, but uh, you can also uh, use a normal analog camera with this and uh, on one of those Raspberries you add a capture device for analog signal and then you could use a normal analog camera. So that's not the point, it was just for convenience that we, from the optics it looked more or less the same like an old camera because it was, was, it was two in a housing. So um, here again we see the zero delay, the live camera image which was received over ethernet by this Raspberry. And then the, the, the good thing about the Raspberry Pi is uh, everybody who knows it, uh, it has an, still an analog out. So it was really easy for us to connect Raspberry to a TV and the TV was uh, obligatory or uh, mandatory for, for uh, this installation because we, you can't do a reconstruction of such an important uh, artwork with flat screens or something. This just wouldn't fit. So instead of using a PC with VGA output where you convert to a composite signal that you can uh, input then to the TV, we just used raspberries which have this by default natively. Um, this buffering here for the delay I will explain in a second. Um, you can use a Raspberry as a TV receiver. There's a lot of IP uh, TV channels that you can receive over Raspberry, which is also an advantage when you do it this way because not everywhere where you go you have uh, cable TV uh, connection or whatever, but internet is most likely everywhere. And of course you can play video in a loop on a Raspberry. And then again we have this switching device. Uh, this time we built this with an, uh, a modern IC, a crosspoint video switch called FMS6501. 
this had an interface to uh, that you could talk to with an Arduino or a microcontroller. So you could map the inputs of this IC where it received component signal to the outputs, which were 12 inputs, nine outputs. It was a perfect fit for wipe cycle. And uh, so we only use six inputs, but um, then you can do everything you need to do for this installation. Um, the delay um, part boils down to some li one line of code, actually. Um, if you are familiar with GStreamer, which is a really, really mighty and uh, useful tool for uh, media art and media art conservators. Um, it's, a, it's a framework of, of uh, modular components which can receive, send, process and a buffer and uh, do everything with audio and video. You just plug it together like you need it and then you have uh, mostly uh, that what you want. Um, so this was the original version, so two tape recorders which loop this tape. This is the new version, just a Raspberry, costs 50 euros or something and one line of code. Uh, actually, we, you can use GStreamer over command line so it, it, it has a command line interface, but you can also use the C library or there's also a Rust library. Um, here you, see, you just receive the, the camera stream, motion JPEG from, from the camera, you pass it to uh, raw frames, and then you put it in a queue and you have to do some uh, parameter magic and then you get an eight second delay, which is just, it buffers the frames into RAM and then it plays them after eight seconds uh, queue, it plays them out. And another important uh, advantage of the Raspberry is that you can directly talk to the frame buffer of the Raspberry. And so you don't need even a desktop environment. So you just have the minimal Raspberry install and can display every content directly to the frame buffer. This saves a lot of uh, error prone stuff. This is the switchboard that we uh, built. It's uh, a PCB board that we um, just made or that we ordered after we designed it. So uh, actually it's not all, this is a reference design that we found on the internet. So it's not uh, super special, but it worked very well. So here is a microcontroller. This one has now the logic which switching uh, process should take place. And um, this one is the input part, and that's the output part where the TVs are connected. I couldn't find a better photo because it was so built in in the new um, setup. This is the code, which actually is everything you need for uh, making wipe cycle happen. You have this, this mapping here where you have an array of arrays. The, the columns are the, the outputs of the TV and the rows are the different states that um, wipe cycle could take. And so you have actually only eight different states wipe cycle can take. So it's the shortest uh, change is always the wipe cycle, which happens every second, uh, every two seconds. So it's the, the middle, uh, the wipe cycle is signal seven. It's changing from one to four, so down to uh, seven on the lower left corner. Then it goes right to eight to nine, and then it goes up again to, uh, what do we have here, uh, six and three, two, one. Um, I like this because uh, this is exactly the same encoding like you had in the mechanical part and like you had on the drawing. So it's different representations of, of the same code, uh, the software of wipe cycle, but um, totally different. So this was the first uh, setup uh, for the rain dance uh, radical software exhibition, a bit messy. Back then you have the raspberries here and the switchboard and a lot of uh, cables all together. It was stuffed in there. 
And uh, so for the next, now it's still on display in the exhibition, writing the history of the future, and we made it a bit uh, more transportable and uh, tidy, so in a tiny case. This is all we need now to, to lend wipe cycle to other institutions. You can easily transport it to another museum and uh, it's more or less plug and play. You just add the TVs and plug the power in and then you have it. Another video which won't work, which uh, shows the end result of the work. I will get the videos on, on the end. So, um, but the, the technique that we developed for wipe cycle, like Morgan said in her introduction, is like these small modules that do certain things, like a time delay or, or a switching between uh, video inputs, that uh, different cameras or something that you then send on to some other device. These are all like, it can be seen like modules that you um, can use for anything else, and it's, uh, it happened that we already had the next use case for track trace, which was the other work we had to reconstruct where you have these delays again. So we just used the same techniques and uh, had this um, additional part here. First used the PC, but then replaced it too with a Raspberry because it simply was not, uh, it was possible to do it all on a Raspberry. So this part uh, chooses which camera to send on to all the other raspberries and they just do the, the buffering to delay it in time. So that's uh, around the switch and six raspberries, it was around 500 euros maximum to, uh, in, in terms of equipment for this new setup. Here you see again the signal flow, the, this is black cameras. <laughs> Okay, inputs over RTSP is the protocol, then uh, the, the server uh, just chooses one of these input signals and streams it on over UDP to the, all the clients, which then buffer it and output it as video signal. So, um, yeah, um, my approach to this um, reconstruction thing, so, um, I would like to give a simple ex, uh, definition by my own. Um, so the essence for the reconstruction like the one we did here should be that the result is as close to the original as possible, but in the same time you try to find a better and more sustainable technological solution for as many components involved as needed. So you eliminate the weak points, but only those that are uh, needed. Big components like a videotape recorder setup. Uh, uh, hmm, used to produce a triangular. Okay, um, you can have several use cases where you uh, just have drop in modules. Like every time now we have something with a time delay, like Peter Weibel's new exhibition has. Uh, this installation Ich Zeit Zeit Ich, where he just does, does the same. He has a camera, two cameras with a time delay on two monitors. We could use the same technology technology um, without any hassle. Um, same we hope to have soon with the Raspberry, which emulates the laser disks, which we have a lot of works that are using laser disks. And um, so if we would have a drop-in replacement that just reads serial signals like the same like the laser disc player would and outputs uh, time coded um, video that would be a really nice thing to have so my takeaways for you uh, is not much but uh, look definitely into gstreamer in combination with raspberry it's a cheap open source and really powerful uh, tool that you can use in many different cases. Um, when you have to do work on an installation, try to break it down in all the essential key parts. So dismantle it in your head, what, which part does what and which part can you replace with something without interfering with the rest. And um, this comes 
of course, with really understanding what this artwork does. We had this dis discussion yesterday. Um, sometimes collectors or museums acquire artworks for whatever reasons, collection, and they don't have a clue what this artwork is actually doing. So this is really bad for uh, the conversation, uh, conservational part. And also, please don't take pictures of multiplex. When you do documentations, nobody needs a picture of a multiplex in a documentation for functionality purpose. <laughs> So thank you for listening. That was long enough. I think we are all open now for questions. Uh, do we have any questions? No? No? no? <laughs> Let me do the kickoff then. Um, hello, me again. Uh, from your presentations, I've been observing that you are trying to be um, loyal to the original when, as for for the launching point. You're trying to even fix some broken computers before trying with the raspberries instead. Um, but when it boils down to the point where it's inevitable and you have to use the current technology, which is heavily digital, but having reference to the the analog, which is going back to the tape feeling, even the glitches would, wouldn't would fit into the idea of having the same aesthetics and, and you avoided using glitches instead. But what about the um, error function? Because anal analog is not repeatable either, so even you made it to run at a steady speed, it will never do that as a computer will run its processor. So the, it, no matter how you try to synchronize those cameras to a certain degrees of approximate times, there will be some errors. Do you also consider that when you are reproducing the artworks, do you also consider that there is this gap between the analog sense of feeling and digital, not only in, in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of the experience as well. Um, so in my opinion, there's always a trade-off. So uh, also we come from different uh, world views, I would say. I'm not a conservator, so I'm more uh, from the daily museums practitioner side of uh, view. So in Every case we have something that is on display in the exhibition, it's a totally different uh, approach than if you work on the collection, on a research project where you, uh, of course you try to uh, keep the analog feeling as long as possible alive if it's possible. But we had to, in this case, where it was track trace and uh, wipe cycle, it was for exhibition purpose and uh, it was a clear decision that we don't go the analog road because we just have a limited budget, we have limited time frames, it was not possible. So it was a trade-off, yes. Maybe we lost some, some of the original feeling, but uh, actually what we did, which I wanted to uh, point out when I said um, keep us close to the original, Breaking, by breaking it down into these components, we still kept the same architecture. So we had this uh, signal sources, the same as we had before on the, in the original work, and we also had the switching device, which was not digital. It, yes, it, it was digital, but it was switching analog signals, composite video. And uh, if, you, if you look at the videos or you compare the old video with the new video, you have, for example, the same uh, rolling, image rolling when you switch from one signal to the other. It looks more or less exactly like the original uh, TV version. So um, in this case, it was uh, 
the decision was really uh, to, to stick with the original architecture and uh, by accident, actually this was not planned, uh, it happened that it was the same uh, switching behavior. So this was the most noticeable uh, difference when we tried out this um, digital wipe cycle software that we were provided before. Sorry. We, we just talked about it yesterday <laughs> evening, actually, that uh, we are not faking anything. We are, we are, it's written on the cartel that it's made in the late, uh, late 60s and that this is a reconstruction, so people are aware. And as any conservation or restoration treatment, our treatment needs to be readable. It's part of our deontology. So any sign that proves that it has been updated is not so bad for us because we are showing the treatment, like there was a treatment and we are not gonna start simulating old glitches or old things. We, it's, it could be weird. To hear that you are also honest to the audience and you are reflecting all these restoration issues. Also, Daniel I's uh, name is on the label of uh, the reconstruction for our cycle. Reconstruction, double punct, Daniel I's. <laughs> and uh, restoration also, we have the name of people working on it. Because it's a big challenge and I think the public also needs to be totally aware of this problem. So. Uh, this is the, yeah, the video. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting point from an aesthetical point of view and from an uh, principal um, art point of view because uh, it's a little bit like with experimental cinema when you uh, experimental cinema has the intention uh, that you not only see a film but you also see how the film is made uh, this is uh, a bit rough but uh, this is basically how experimental mm -hmm. filmmakers work so we are in the cinema and at the same time you look at the machine which is the cinema and you look how yeah. it works and this is for the future, I think, extremely important what you just said, that you, uh, that you are reconstructing and at the same time you make clear it's a reconstruction, it's a construction <laughs> and it's not identical with, with what has been in 1961. Because, uh, of course, you can't simulate that. Uh, what you described, uh, um, I, I witnessed uh, some of these early uh, stuff in <laughs> at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. Of course, it was permanently breaking together, collapsing and so on. This was normal. You were used to it. Sometimes you waited for hours until it <laughs> ran again. You can't do that in a, in a, in a museum now. Uh, this wouldn't make uh, so much sense. Uh, the other question, uh, question which I have um, is uh, you all worked, as far as I see, with all the works you had uh, the opportunity to talk to the artists. Uh, you worked with the artists. Um, how important, uh, you, you always said it's very important to have this possibility, uh, but uh, what's your imagination uh, about the cases where the artists are not there anymore? Do you have experiences with that? Right now is a rush hour. So we have, actually we have artists also contacting us right now, because uh, for example, uh, Edmond Couchot, which is mm, 87, he contacted us and said, okay, I'm super old, I want to give all my work to someone that can take care of it, I'm still here, I still have my head, and I want to help you reconstruct some of, of my old artworks before I passed. And Jeffrey also came to the camp and said, okay, I'm giving you five of my best artworks, they are not existing anymore, so I make a donation of nothing 
just the concept and we're going to build it together and rebuild it together. I'm going to give you everything I have in my mind because most of them have no documentation. And so we just realized this, like, this year and last year, a lot of artists are actually in this urgence and we are also. So we, did, <coughs> we took the list of our collection. We looked all the artwork we bought in the, in the 90s and we looked where we have no documentation and where are the artists that are the most aging right now. And we are now doing a whole assessment of the whole collection, targeting artworks, contacting the artists, asking for the opinion, for documentation, for helping us to reconstruct. This is also why we contacted Paul Garin. So uh, actually we are trying to not arrive at this point where we have nothing anymore. And in that, in that case, it will be just an indicator of something. The sheets live longer than yeah. men, but not for eternity. So for the artwork that will be lost, it will be lost. We shouldn't do therapeutical... What have you called this? Acharnement uh, therapeutic. Uh, oh, uh. In English, therapeutical, uh, yeah, uh, med like medical. We don't want to make zombies. Yeah, <laughs> something like not really living and not really dead. So, but we, we thought for a moment with um, when we worked first on UP Ghetto, we didn't knew that Paul had backups. He wasn't sure at first, actually. So we thought really, oh, that's that's it. We must. Perhaps okay. we lost an artwork, first one. And we tried to make a rule that no artwork will die on our watch. So that was really uh, <laughs> stressy. But yeah, we were really lucky because he had the backups. But yeah, we, we were thinking about that day and we tried to avoid that because that's really important, yes. And I think it would be really hard for, m for me to reconstruct something just on the basis of a video with a, like just on, about on the functionality of an art piece. Because for example, for UP Ghetto, we have a video, extended video showing how it works. I could guess, you know, which part of the clip is played. I could program it on Raspberry quite easily. But I will have lost, you know, the whole thing about what they created. They created interfaces and software to do what they needed to do at that time. And all of this part will have been totally lost. We couldn't have documented. So I will have difficulties to rebuild things from scratch without seeing the original, the initial work, or without documenting. It will be difficult. But I think some artwork will have to be like this. And oh, you can see the. This is the image scrolling. kind of glitchy transition from one to the next video. And this was a success. Other questions? Yeah. We lost a lot of people. <laughs> it's late. Yeah. Uh, we have to finish. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.